boards. Right. So just so you guys know, I'm going to be primarily just chatting with you today. I do have a handout of resources that's going to be sent out to you after the workshop, but I kind of like to look at faces. So if you're not like in your draws and you want to log on and let me look at you, that'd be great because I imagine we'll be a small group um, and it just helps me to check in and we can give visual you know, references, which is easier sometimes than trying to turn your little hand on or whatever. Um, but I was curious as to how many of you are, have a family member or someone that you're really close to that is on the spectrum. Is anybody coming from life experience? No, it's more of what you're working with in work, maybe that you're curious. This is Samantha. I have a nephew who is severely autistic. Okay. Right. I think so many of us are impacted now, you know, with someone who's close to us. It's such a common thing. <laughs> All right, so I think we're gonna get started. Um, so good to see everybody and feel free to jump into the chat and give me a message. I have that up on the side as well so I can see your questions as we go along and I'll be sure at the end to leave some time to Q&A and to chat with you guys um, because I think you know we all learn from each other. So, um, so I wanna present to you today um, a little bit, I've, everybody can make sure you're muted just in case. Because I feel I'm hearing some kind of sound, that'd be great. Um, so I'm going to present to you today, kind of, and from the standpoint of a case study. I am not some kind of a special, you know, um, I'm not some kind of a special specialist in this area. Um, I am just a citizen, <laughs> an arts person, a creative, a business professional, someone who's worked a lot with nonprofits. That about five or six years ago, just develop such a heart for young people with autism. And in my digging, um, which was also, you know, contributed to by my best friend who runs a school for autistic young people. Um, <clears throat> I just learned about it, started to get intrigued by the personalities that I was meeting and just really felt compelled to try to find a way to assist in the transition for these young people to, um, activities that they may have previously been locked out of, um, which might be work opportunities work opportunities, internship opportunities, things like that. And so I've learned quite a bit. Um, I've worked for many, many years with nonprofits and I've done a lot of relief work all over the world um, and things like that. But the autism group was one that I had not specifically been exposed to until uh, that time. So it was new to me. And, um, and what I've had is just an incredible journey. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of that journey. One of the things I want to do, if I can figure out how to do it, is show you a quick video, because I think it's, it's one of the first projects that we did. It's only a couple of minutes. It's one of the first projects that we did with young people. And I think that it'll give you kind of a sense of my heart, but also of some of the young people that I've been able to work with in the last few years. So I'm going to see if I can share that with you. Let's see how I do this. All right, here we go. I'm not the best at this. <laughs> you cannot minimize Zoom when you're recording this meeting. Okay. All right. Um, let me see if I can figure it out for you. Hold on. Well, I don't know how to show it to you. Usually the share screen is right there for me and I don't see it today. Oh wait, there it is. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna share my screen with you guys and hopefully you've got it. Angela, can you see my screen? Can you just confirm? Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna show you guys this little video. Jenna Forstall, I am the author of Why the Girl Became Cat. <laughs> I 
So I had the idea for this book a couple years ago, and I was going through a rough time. I'd been in a lot of pain, uh, chronic pain, since I had had a car accident. And um, I, at the time, I just took some time off work to recover, and I started to ask myself what was really important to me. And one of the things I realized was that I'd had some creative ideas that had never come to fruition yet. And this little book was one of them. First thing I did was pick up the phone and call uh, Liz Finning with AFA. My name is Liz Finning. I'm a program supervisor at Actors for Autism, which is a non profit which provides vocational training for young adults on the spectrum in film, animation, video game design, and visual effects. And when she called looking for an illustrator for a children's book, we all turned to each other and said, we should pitch Matt. Matt loves illustrating and particularly is really, really wonderful at animating animals. It's his favorite thing to draw. Something about the dynamics between the animals and the humans and like I was like this he's perfect because he gets it. He researched animal behavior, he researched human behavior. I looked at some uh, some reference of what a curiosity uh, face would look like. I even seen some reference in myself as I uh, um, look at the mirror and I see like what would my uh, my curiosity face would look like. Um, and that's where I got that uh, I that, ins that inspiration from. And I, as an observer, can't tell you why, but his innate, you know, curiosity about what does na what do natural micro expressions look like have ha have helped him to create quality work because you feel that you know exactly what this cat is feeling <laughs> and what she's feeling and it's so true to their character and I'm so glad that we're where we are like when I saw the book locked up i literally cried because i was so Aww. excited to me you know being a girl i grew up in the south and i i don't think i had the feeling i wasn't taught to think that i could be whatever i wanted to be i was kind of felt limited by either my own skill set or by the environment i was in or just i wasn't given the opportunity to think about all these different options that could have been out there for me and i want i want other girls to have that i was able to also hire two other young men on the spectrum to assist so one of them was patrick duran he helped us by shooting behind the scenes footage and helping us with some editing and then i also hired um, a young man named kyle helgren he helped us create basically the audioscape, the world that you hear in the digital book. And so we had a little girl send us some voices and then we had found cat sounds and then Kyle made some sounds, found some sounds and he put everything together to make the soundscape for the digital book. So when you listen to that, you'll know that there was also a beautiful young man who worked on that. What's really important to me to point out is that this dream, this creative dream would not have happened without these young men. And I am so excited to have worked with them, to have had the opportunity to mentor them, to hire them and pay them for this project. And um, I just can't wait to do other projects with uh, these young men who are so talented. And I know that with the increasing number of uh, young people on the spectrum in our country right now, we have to find opportunities for them. And yes, sometimes it takes extra time, it takes extra work and it takes extra support, but it's extremely, extremely important that we empower these young people and that we assist these families in creating work that utilizes their creative gifts and allows them to contribute to society, to business, and to the future. Matt's been supportive of my little vision here and it wouldn't have existed without him. And that's why I feel like Matt's story is so important to be told and this story is important to be told because um, I think there are a lot of talented young people out there like Matt who need opportunity. And I hope that by telling his story, we'll be able to get more of them hired and paid and utilize so that their creative gift can go forward. This is not something I can do. I could have never made this by myself. No, never. You made this happen. So thank you. You're, you're, you're welcome, Shanna. Like, um, um, like, um, and, and, and thank you. Um, um, th thank you for um, for believing in me, Shanna. Of course, it was easy. <laughs> you're amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Gosh, they make me cry. <laughs> They're so amazing. Let me make sure this video is off so we don't have to hear the music anymore or what's next on YouTube. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. They, the, the, I got booted out of the group because there's another joy, I guess. And they moved oh. her and they thought they were moving her and they moved me. And then I was stuck in who knows where. La -la for land. Oh no, well, we're glad you're back, Joy. <laughs> if you can, can you put the link to that video in the, um, 
like the chat and I'll watch it. Like, thank you. Yes, I will. And if you, and I have, it's just why the girl.com as well, but you'll get all of my links afterwards as well. I've sent in a handout after, so we'll catch you up, Joy. Thank you. Um, Yeah. So as you can see, I mean, this, this was like one of the first main projects I did with the boys and it just, I forgot I had this video and I found it like, it just makes me cry every time I watch it because I love the boys so much. I mean, you can see how precious they are and you can see, um, you know, just the joy that I got from working with them. That's genuine joy. And I, what I think my message to you today is we're going to talk about some of the challenges of activating young people. Um, some of the wins that we've seen and, and talk about the structure that I've used to get to where I am with this. But there, I think there are thousands of ways to do this. And what I hope is at the end of today and at the end of this little workshop, you feel inspired to find a way to activate some young people in your area because working closely with parents and with educators of young people with autism, there is such a need for activation. And they are another people group that has been passed over when it's come to opportunity. So hopefully that's what will happen today is that I'll inspire you to find your way to activate someone um, that you that you can fall in love with, like the way I fall in love with the boys um, that I've worked with. So um, autism is a growing problem in this country. There is an increasing number of young people being born with autism. It is a much higher number of males than females. And what I found is that, you know, what it's resulted in is it's becoming so common and it's been around for so long that we have a, a huge population in the United States right now of young people who have aged out of high school, but because of their, um, you know, placement on the spectrum, they have a difficulty, like they have difficulty getting educated properly or getting job opportunities or internship opportunities. So when I started to find out about this and I had the book idea, I was like, oh, you know, maybe that's something I can do is hire a young person who's on the spectrum to help me illustrate because that's not a gift that I have. You know, I wrote this little story. It just came to me one day and it was kind of important to me. I'm coming from, you know, a Southern misogynist background and just all the things. And I thought, you know, I want little girls going forward to understand that they can be whatever they want to be. It was, it started that simple, you know, and I wrote this little book and I was like, I don't draw, <laughs> I don't even draw a stick man. You know, I'm just not, not good in that area. Um, and so finding Matt changed everything because not only did we start meeting regularly, I started mentoring him, collaborating with him. We hired him. He got paid for his work. Um, it was the first peak of first piece of published work he'd ever had. Um, and it just became such a beautiful experience because we saw Matt go from someone who could barely communicate in the beginning. He would be so nervous that he's one of the ones who really struggles with communication. He's brilliant. Um, but sometimes he just has trouble getting the connect from here to here. And we saw him progress through the months of our work together. I would meet with him every time I would meet with him. I have a camera running. Every time I'd meet with him, I would ask him questions on camera to just get him more and more comfortable and by the end of it, we did some press with him and he was incredible. Like he would just blow us away. We'd look at each other like, oh my gosh. Like he was not only able to think through what the project had meant to him, but he was able to communicate it in the most beautiful way. So I've seen firsthand the impact of just working directly with someone, um, you know, uh, that was just one of the projects that we did. That project ended up being a, a written book that's produced in hard copy form and any proceeds from that go back to hiring more young people. Um, but then we also did a digital book that's online so kids can watch it on their iPad. And that actually led to a turn of events which has me writing continuous children's stories with a production company where I'm able to hire Matt ongoing. And we actually have um, a packet in right now to get him on as, a, as an intern. Um, to get him on as an intern for uh, longevity, you know, to work with us for like the next six months paid by the state of California, um, which would be amazing. And so I actually have three boys in that queue right now between me and my business partner um, that we want to, we want to take on and, you know, keep with us for the next while. Um, so when you look at working with someone on the spectrum, you know, the, the thing about the spectrum is it literally is a spectrum. <laughs> There's not like, you know, there's not one attribute, there is not one challenge, there is not one uh, benefit. There, are, Every person is absolutely unique and every young person it has different skill levels, different means of communication, different means of understanding, different areas of, of not understanding. And it is an absolutely challenging thing to navigate that when you're working with young people. But 
I think there's also such a beauty in that. And I know personally, I've learned so much from just being exposed to all these different young people and adjusting myself to understand and to learn and then helping, you know, in any way that I can to inspire them and, and, and be able to pull things out of them. Um, just as a case study, I want to talk about some of the different things that I've been able to utilize these young people for, because I'm hoping it will give you ideas about how you could possibly hire, mentor, or empower a young person in your life. So my main catalyst for finding these young people, because I'm coming from the industry of film and production, I was in film and TV as a professional actress for 12 years as a producer for many years. I produced reality TV. I've produced corporate content. I've produced uh, short films, documentaries in India and places like that on schools for disabled children. I've done quite a variety of work, but my background is production. So when I found AFA Hub, which is the, the program that I'm hiring most of these kids from, um, it became an absolute resource for me because one, they'd already been vetted. Two, they'd already been through a training program. And three, the school does a great job of providing support. Support is something that's absolutely crucial in this trajectory of taking a young person and activating them. And that support can come from parents, which is always ideal when the parents are super supportive, from an educational system like AFA Hub or from you know some other system. Um, there, we've actually just started a production company that will really just, it will just hire these young people People, and then we will have a support system for them of two or three professionals that oversee their work and support them so that they can be successful. Um, so it does take a structure and it does take some form of education and then uh, support, but it's extremely possible and it's wonderful. And I can tell you, it's changed my life. Um, some of the things that we've done, just because I think you might find it interesting, is I've worked with New Orleans Fashion Week for eight years and um, a few years ago, I was working with a videographer, a very talented young man uh, named Easton, and I was able to take Easton because he is high functioning and I had built a long term relationship with him. Um, I was able to take him twice out of state to do shoots, which I think is pretty impressive. And he came with me to New Orleans. He shot New Orleans Fashion Week for a week with us. Um, and it was incredible at the impact that he had. And then of course that his work ended up having for that nonprofit endeavor. Um, and then I've been able to uh, also take Easton. I done humanitarian aid work all over the South. I'm from New Orleans, just outside of New Orleans, lived there for years and uh, worked every storm since Katrina. <laughs> no matter where I was, even though I'm in California, I've flown back this time. I'm like, I have to sit this one out. I'm exhausted. <laughs> but um, I've been working every every storm in the South since Katrina, which means the, the big, big flood in the Baton Rouge area that happened, the flood of, I don't know what they called it, flood of a hundred years or something. It was ins insane. And then the, the hurricane that ripped through uh, Houston and Texas, I've worked all of that, but I was actually able to take Easton to do, um, you know, humanitarian aid work as well and take him into the field with a small team. And, you know, it, it when I look at that, I think that's, a, those are huge accomplishments and they come, they are the payout of years of mentorship and working with someone. Um, but, you know, if you look at a school like AFA Hub, and the reason I think their work is really important is because one, it creates uh, sustainable educational opportunity. And because of COVID, they've actually gone 100% online. So now they've been able to open up not just to young people in California, but to young people all over the US who can sign on to a virtual class and learn amazing skills. So they're learning how to animate, they're learning video game design, they're learning editing, they're learning how to shoot, they're learning, you know, uh, illustration, they're learning special effects. And so they've been able to, through the years, educate these young people and then provide them with internship and job opportunities. Some of them are working for major production companies right now doing, you know, special effects and video game work and all of that. So it's really exciting to me that these conduits are rising up in the United States right now to provide opportunity. But definitely there is a need for that ongoing education and the ongoing support. So if you're looking for some, a young person who could do that kind of work, those opportunities are absolutely there and, you know, available. I don't think it's limited to that. I think that, you know, I've been recently because I'm so much involved in the arts field now and, um, and in music, I've been able to hire, you know, administrative help with young people who are on the spectrum. Um, I've been able to hire, you know, people that are more involved in music and other areas rather than just production. So I think sometimes it's just a matter of us looking around to see who's available, what kind of education or knowledge they have, and then matching that to the need that we or someone else might have. But again, the structure, the support structure is absolutely important. Um, 
Let's see. So AFA is is an interesting uh, project and it's been super successful and they continue to add on. Again, they've gone virtual. They're in all the states. And if you know someone with a young person, because what happens is a lot of the young people on the spectrum, they tend to be naturally good. Some of them tend to be naturally good at technical work. And so if they are, um, I found a lot of parents I've run into in the last few years who they they have a young person on the spectrum. That person is already looking on YouTube and learning how to do things. They just don't have professional training or professional support system. They're already editing. They're already animating. They're doing all these things because a lot of them have a natural skill set in that area. They're drawn to it. And it's something they can do at home on their laptop, you know, in a safe, quiet place or wherever it is that they need to be to function best um, with parental support or teacher support. So yeah, if you know that link will be in the handout. Um, it's it's, it's a great program. I highly recommend it because of the support they provided to make opportunity for the young people. Um, you know, challenges, I, I would say for sure that the benefits outweigh the challenges. I have learned so much from working with these young people. Like I said before, each one of them is different and special and unique. And there's not just their skill sets, but their personalities and the the knowledge that they bring in. Sometimes, you know, that's the thing about creatives or, uh, you know, people on the spectrum or whatever, is that they bring an, a unique viewpoint of the world. And I've had them seriously impact my work because they may have a completely different view about something than I've had. Even just with the cat book, for example, you know, Matt's insight on the way children interact with animals and his perception of how animals impact the world was just breathtaking sometimes the way he would describe things to me or you know the way he would bring things to life it was it was absolutely stunning to me and it's affected every children's story I've written since then um so you know I would encourage you to if you are finding a young person that you can work with look for those opportunities of where you can learn you know because as much as I mentor <laughs> I get taught every time I have an interaction with these young people they inspire me and they teach me something that I can really use about the way I look at the world or respond to the world or people or animals or whatever else is out there um, so there's there are a lot of benefits it's, um, you know, right now it's, it's been incredible because we have three, like I said, that we're about to take on full-time pretty much under internships that are paid internships where they're being paid by the state of California to work for us, which is incredible. And they'll get the support of the AFA structure to do that work at a high level. Um, so I'm really excited about that. But along the way, I've also personally and my, my company and then my business partners and I um, have hired a lot of these young people directly. Patrick, who was referenced in the video, I was the first person to ever give him a check. And just the look on his face. I mean, the young man was like 24 when I met him and he just turned 30. And, um, you know, the look on his face when we gave him a check for a hundred dollars for like a little edit job was just you know, and he's bought a new laptop because of the work we've done together. And he's, you know, been exposed to so many things. We actually take him on shoots with us when we're in LA, because that's where he's based. We took him on a music video shoot, you know, a couple months ago, and uh, we bring him on set with us and all the things. And, you know, it's, it's the opportunities are endless if we just take the time to to look and see who's there, what's there, and what can we do to engage them in the arts. And I think, you know, I've met so many parents who've been so impacted by having a child with autism. And, and as someone who's not a parent of an autistic child, I can only imagine some of my best friends have autistic young people and it's, it's a journey, even if they're high, if, even if they're high functioning, it's a journey. And it is a very special, unique path that these parents have to walk. So finding ways to empower these young people to educate, to mentor, and especially to hire and help provide income for that family um, or and to give that person all these young men that have been able to just give a sense of worth because, you know, they can buy their own computer, they can buy their own this or that. You know, I've had so many parents come back and just say, thank you. They're a different, they're a different young man because of that impact. And then the, the professionals have been able to expose them to, um, if you look around and you bring on a young person, oftentimes, if you reach out to those in your circle, they'll be open and willing to allow them exposure to work processes or training or other things as well. And you could really open up a world of opportunity for that young person that they may not have access to financially or just because of lack of opportunity. So as catalyst, I mean, I may be one person and I may be a small person. Nothing I do is really that important 
important to, to the world, but, you know, to me and to the people I work with, I think it is. And I think sometimes we underestimate our power, you know, so part of my message to you today is just to not underestimate the impact of you reaching out to one young person, hiring one young person, mentoring one young person, because that affects a whole family, it affects a whole community, and it paves the way for other young people who are on the spectrum to take advantage of opportunity or to even know that it's possible. Um, let's see, let's see. So AFA has been amazing. I, I saw one of the resources, there's some resources in the packet that I'm going to draw because I assume that if you're here, it's because you're either wanting to work with young people, you already are working with young people, or you have people in your family who are affected by autism. Um, and some of the resources that I've found are, are pretty helpful. Um, one is, of course, the school AFA. Two is the production company that they've launched separate from that, that will be hiring out these young people and providing a support system so they can make real wages. Um, Three is there's a there's a project called Restoring Balance. If you know parents, I'm just going to mention it shortly here, but it's called Restoring Balance Autism. And I came on as a creative producer for that project. It's a documentary started as a documentary film project. And Ryan Hetrick is a medical professional who's been working with young people on the spectrum for many years. And he started documenting the growth and recovery patterns of young people and started looking at, you know, what, because there is no one answer when it comes to what causes autism, there's not one answer. There are a myriad of things that are causing the autism syndrome in the United States. It, some people call it a genetic disease, but no genetic disease in the history of time has ever grown at the rate that autism has. Um, what we're seeing is that it's probably a accumulation of factors, um, you know, and, and a lot of it has to do with the toxicity of our earth and of things that are happening around us and that affecting mothers, mothers affecting children. And it just, it just became a prevalent thing. So there are people who are studying this and the impact of treating it as an illness and not a genetic disease. And they're seeing increasingly re amazing results, um, on that side in, in, young people who maybe haven't been inaudible their whole lives are starting to speak. And you know, there's a beautiful case study in the documentary about a young woman who was in her 20s. She was living with her mother. Um, they assumed that she would always be completely dependent. She did have a job. She was working at a grocery store, but she had to have a full-time monitor. Twenty, you know, Every hour she worked, there was someone standing next to her and all she did was stock shelves. But after you know, doing some of the, the treatments and things, just the natural treatments and starting to get well, her, her vocabulary increased to her normal age. She started working as a cashier in the store and did not need a full-time monitor next to her anymore. And she also moved into a group home and she also got a love relationship, which is super rare for people who are at her level of autism. Um, so you saw this young woman who had been completely dependent on her mother in every way, financially, emotionally, at work, she was completely dependent on other people who all of a sudden within a year and a half was able to have a much more functional life. And she's a beautiful soul. And you know she is able to understand and communicate better and get a job that was more progressive for her where she interacts with people all day long, you know? And so there are stories like that in the Restoring Balance documentary that are really amazing and inspiring. And Brian is a wonderful soul. I know him well. And uh, because I, I helped, you know, produce this documentary and you will love him. And like all he wants is for people to be educated. He is not trying to make money. He is not trying to sell or hawk anything. He is just literally trying to help families with everything in him. And he's been doing it for decades. So that's something that's a great resource. It's the film, but it's also an online community. If you know parents who are looking for a positive, supportive, you know, very fact filled um, and, and just exciting community to, to, to join that information will be on there as well. Um, there's so many directions I can go, but I felt like today, if you're here, it's because you have an interest and I'd like to know more about what that is. Like if there are any questions I can answer or experience I can share, or maybe I have questions for you because you guys might know more than me, but um, I'd love to chat with you more if you guys have any questions or anything um, as far as, uh, you know, what we can talk about. I'm also going to peek into the chat now and see what's up. So hi, Karen. Um, yes, you have worked with people. And thank you. Yes. So it's, I'm going to write this in the chat right now, AFA Hub. Um, they've turned it into, it started, you know, it's funny is AFA started as just like an acting and social skills class for these young people. 
And then they just started adding on and then it became this full-fledged technical school in the last so many years. So now that whole technical school is called AFA Hub. Um, and all of this will be in the handout that they're gonna send you guys, but just in case. Um, Huddle Films is the new production company that they'll be using to uh, hire out these young people with a, an amazing support system. So they'll be able to do animation, illustration, video game work, titling for films, all of that kind of stuff. It's really wonderful. Um, let's see. Job coaching. Um, Yes, I, I think I am. I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely hiring, mentoring young people. Um, if the question was, are you basically you're doing job coaching as well? Um, and yes, so the organization has just asked me to take a greater role because I've always, at one point I was, I was hiring and mentoring five young men at the same time on projects. It's like, wow. Um, so it's kind of become a job to me, uh, but I love it. And um, so they have asked me to take a greater role in just um, helping to mentor. Have I ever taught autistic children, Charlie? Um, only in the form that we're talking about. I have not taught an organized classroom. I don't have a degree as a teacher. So I, I know that there are people way more qualified than me, but um, I'm kind of like the crazy aunt who comes in and like the school really, the schools I've worked with uh, really mothers the children in a sense of creating a super safe space and then providing them with education and a very safe, supportive environment. What they bring me in for a lot of times is to take them to the next level. So I'm like the aunt who kind of comes in and like challenges them a little more. And, you know, I, I um, work with them to give them feedback, to take them to the next level. Then the school can take them with skill sets by exposing them to professionals who are really good at what they do. And will take the time to work with them, empower them and move them forward um, and then work with them on. You know, it's better for them to learn with me before we send them out to, to the, the big world um, as far as because they learn job etiquette. They learn how to do a resume. They learn how to interview. You know, I could just hire them, but I don't. We put them through an interview process with me and my business partner. And, you know, uh, we help them uh, grow from that. And we along the way, while they're doing work, we do assessment and we provide feedback and we help them to grow. And I think I can say without any hesitation that every one of the people who've come to us have grown to a new level after spending so many months with us, because I'm, I personally am intent on, um, and focused, always focused on improvement. And I, I don't let them just sit back and go, oh, well, no, like, no, I don't take any excuse. I'm like, no, this, I know what their capabilities are. I know what their training is. And I'm pretty, I'm an, I'm an empath, I study personality types, communication types, all of the things. And I know when someone can go further and I'm all about pulling them to that next level because I, I know that, you know, sometimes when we're in a unique people group or we have what someone else might consider a handicap or a special challenge, you know, we'll sit back and go, well, they're no, no, <laughs> I'm that person who steps in. I'm like, guess what? We're going to do this and we're going to do it great. And we're not going to stop till we get it, you know, and, and, um, I think that's one of the things the school loves about people like us. And hopefully what you guys will do is that we come in from the outside. I don't come in with fatigue, like a parent, you know, I don't come in with um, that overprotectiveness or that fatigue of having to deal with someone, you know, again and again and again, I get to come in and just in, inspire, motivate, learn, grow with them, evolve with them. And that's the luxury of me not being someone who does this full time and not honestly of just not being a parent who has to deal with it every day. You know, I have such a hard, I, you know, I started writing children's stories with a production company out of LA and I start. it started with why the girl became a cat and they heard, they heard it and they're like, Hey, do you want to write more for our company? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I started writing and, and Matt works with me ongoing for graphics for that. And then some, when we do video projects um, and audio projects, the other boys get hired for that as well. But, you know, we had some things set to release during the year of COVID. But then when COVID hit, we're like, oh my gosh, let's get this out because we have such a heart for parents. And my business partner and music producer there, um, he writes music specifically for young people on the spectrum. He has a nephew on the spectrum and his music is magical and it has such a soothing quality. So we have parents who have written to us and they have children who, you know, may have emotional meltdowns or may freeze or, you know, maybe self-harming and things like that. And they'll use the music and the stories to soothe them. So that's that's the kind of stuff that inspires me because I think that, you know, when we're not exposed to certain groups of divert for diversity, just because we haven't been, maybe you've never met an, a 
parent who has someone on the spectrum, or maybe you've never met a young person or been around one who's on the spectrum. Like, we don't know, right? I've actually found it's pretty common here in Tennessee. I've already hired two people here to work with me in administration who are on the spectrum. I didn't even know, which was crazy. Uh, I, from their resume, I didn't even know. It was after they looked up my my um, my re- my uh, work, they were like, oh my gosh, I'm on the spectrum. And I'm like, that's crazy. I think I just draw people. But um, there's something, you know, really special about this whole process. And I think hopefully today it'll light a fire in you and you'll go, hmm, I want to know more about this. And I want to know more about what I can do to activate this beautiful group of people. Um, And maybe also, you know, if you start to dig into it, you may learn the challenges that parents of autistic young people face and be able to provide support in some way to them as well. Even if that's, you know, not hiring someone, but maybe it's just, you know, being part of their, their village. That, raise that raises that young person or, or exp- helping to expose that young person to activities or whatever, or just being there for that parent when they've had a rough patch because it can be really, really difficult. Um, and I, you know, I don't know that firsthand, but I know it's secondhand pretty well. Um, let's see. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I mean, autism is interesting because there is no set cure for this. And and then some people would argue that there doesn't need to be a cure, you know, but the people that I've worked with who are researchers, they say that, you know, if we look at it as, if we do look at it as a medical issue and not a genetic issue, and then what we've done is allowed space for improvement. And so everyone that I work with that is into what they call autism recovery, which some people have a problem with that term, but I don't think we should because there are different levels of, of growth and evolution. And what they're saying is if a child's brain inflammation can be brought down, if the child's gut balance can be brought back into, into, you know, proper levels, then they're much better at being able to understand and learn and communicate. So if you, you know, there, there is growth to be had. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand in years of research and years of case study that Ryan's done. Um, There's absolutely improvement of life for the young person or the or the adult that's on the spectrum, um, those those opportunities are out there. That knowledge is out there. Um, does anyone have any questions or does anyone have any comments? I just want to open the floor up. Um, yes, hi Joy. Um, I wonder if in the work that you've done, have you seen any positive changes in the systems of the professional hiring practices? Um, because a lot of what I've read from the autistic community, less from the scientific or medical community is, you know, don't make me fit my neurodivergence into your system. Let me be me. The system is part of the problem. And so coming out of the, you know, conversation we had this morning, right. Have you seen any positive changes in terms of, you know, you talked about like helping them make their resume and do an interview, but, you know, has there been any, have you seen any changes on the other end, not just the individual having to change to fit in to work in that environment, but the environment changing to better accommodate neurodivergence? Right. So I can mostly just speak to the workplaces that I've worked in or helped provide. And I know we are constantly adjusting to see what we can do, like you said, to adjust to the individual rather than them having to adjust to us. But I have not seen a lot of growth. And you're right. The feedback is that it's very hard to change a structure that's been established for so long. People are used to doing things a certain way. And when you when I have hired people on the spectrum, most of the time it has required a shift in the way I do things, whether that's in the way we communicate or, you know, the support level we provide or the communication style that we use or the accountability systems or whatever, you know, it, it, it absolutely requires change on my side to do it well as an employer and as a mentor. So I think you're right. That's how the system is going to have to change. Um, there's talk, there's definitely talk, but like, you know, in Phoenix succession, when I was saying, I was like, that's what I feel like in this area too, is like, there's so much talk, but then there is there the support system, because I'll tell you it's, I've done this internship program that I have three boys in queue right now. We would put them to work tomorrow. I have projects tomorrow, but it has been months 
for some of their paperwork because we're waiting for it to go through a system that is sluggish, that was created in the 1970s and is not serving the population the way that it should be. So that's really frustrating because I am the most patient of all because I've been doing this for so many years and I understand how hard it is where there are other employers who say, yes, I want to hire a young person on the spectrum to do editing with our team. We'll provide the support system. We'll provide a mentor, all these things. But then the paperwork takes so long that by the time the young person is approved, the opportunity has moved on. So there is a lot of frustration with people who are trying to create opportunity when the systems that, in play, that are in place are aged and not supporting people on the spectrum as well as they could. Now, I can't speak to that in Tennessee because I'm fairly new here. I've only been in Tennessee since last year and it's been COVID. So and I've been finishing up the projects I'd already started with young people in California because it's all remote work anyway. Um, but I'm getting more engaged here. And like I said, I've already personally hired two people here on the spectrum for administrative work and you know marketing work and things. But I've done that just as an individual who had some hours to give. And I ended up choosing people who were on the spectrum because I could because I knew that I could make the accommodations to make that happen. But it's going to take individuals and it's going to take structural change that might take decades. So that's why I think things like this, this diversity workshop are important because if the five, six, seven of us go out and do something, then we've done something today. This week, we can make a change in our community for people on the spectrum and for families that have young people on the spectrum. Whereas if we wait for the system to change, it could be decades. I mean, sure, I hope it changes. I will do whatever I can to be a catalyst for that change. But no, it's a very slow process. And from what I've heard from parents, it's frustrating. You know, this this young man I'm trying to hire, I've been working, I've been hiring him for six years on and off. We're trying to get him under this dedicated program where he would get paid and mentored. And I have a professional waiting to work with him. Like a 30-year editor is gonna mentor him weekly. The paperwork. The mother called me yesterday and said, Shanna, they called me the third time to get the, the information on the employer. The third time that she's provided the information, it's been months, you know, and it, and this opportunity could have walked away because of the delay and there's no reason for the delay. So it's frustrating because the system is not um, equipped as it can. I, can I push back a little yes. and say, why do we have to wait on the system to pay this person? Why can't the professional? We don't. And them? I have hired, like okay. I said, I've <laughs> continuously hired young people on and off again for years. And I continue to do it. I have three that I'm paying personally right now. But here's the thing is like, because they require, they do require a support system and they do require a lot of times mentoring to get to the next level or to get to the levels of real professional work. Um, it, you know, it helps to have that support system help pay for that extra time that the professionals have to give, right? Okay. So it's the professionals not getting paid. They're giving all their time to help, but for the young person to get paid for all the extra hours and the extra effort, that's what we're fighting for is for the young person to be subsidized. So they make the money and they okay. get the opportunity of, of mentorship and work, right? And then a build a resume because in production industry, no one's going to hire you if you don't have a resume. You have to be able to say, I've worked on these projects, right? And be able to show that work. So that's what we're trying to help them build with opportunity. Um, let's see. This is Charlie Newton. I have a question for you. Yes. Yeah, hi, yes. Charlie. I have, you know, hi. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. You know, um, I've had two autistic kids in my art classes. And uh, right now I have one new student who's autistic. Mm -hmm. And um, I just need some advice of, you know, of how to welcome this person into the class. You know, uh, the first class he came with his mother mm -hmm. and uh, he, he actually didn't want to be there. So yeah. I think it was a surprise to him that she was bringing him to class. He's like, where am I? Yeah. Right. And, uh, but once everybody started drawing and everything, you know, he started doing his own thing. I want to know, do you have any suggestions? He's around 10 years old. So I'm trying to find out how I can work with this young person. Right. You know, I can make him feel safe. Nobody else in, in the class actually know him. Yeah. The other autistic person I had, you know, 
he had a, a huge support system. All the kids knew him anyway. So oh, that's could, good. Yeah. I can only speak as, a, as you know, a person. I'm not a trained professional or teacher, okay. but what I will say is that I found with each of the young people, when I first start spending time with them, I really try to go off of their cues because the way they understand and interpret the world, the way they communicate and the way they hear um, and learn and are able to respond is different. Each one is different. So I try to pay attention. Like I have one young man that he, if I get him to write the notes, like if I give him notes on a video, I can't just tell him ever. So when we started doing it, he's like, I need to write it down. I'm like, okay. So first I started writing it for him, but that wasn't good enough. It got to the point where I have to dictate, then he will type his own notes. And sometimes I'm typing them too. And I'll send them to him later, just as a bump to remember, to make sure we didn't miss anything. But for him, he has to connect what he's hearing and he says it out loud. So I need to do this. And then when he types it through his fingers, then he understands, right? But the, the thing about this is each young person is different. Some of them are, they are okay with me being close to them and they love the attention of like, hey, I, they love when I shake their hand. They love when I sit next to them to work. Some of them need space. You know, some of them um, understand really well uh, through space through what I speak and then they get it right away smart boom but then they have trouble communicating it back or getting their questions out so I have to give them a lot of space and time to come back to me and say okay why don't you think about that for a minute and then when you have a question you can either say you know let me know if you want to speak to me about it or you want to write me an email or give them the space to even write it if they need to think it like so each young person is different and i think you you the fact that you're asking the question says to me that you'll figure it out but it's really just about paying attention to the cues how do they how do they how do they take in data and then how can they give it back and then right. watching them for you know moments where they might get flooded or anxious or whatever so that we can figure out what the trigger are is and back it off for them so that you know until because some of them will never learn how to ask for what they need some of them do when they get older but maybe not you know and, and they have interesting quirks like i have one kid who's worked with me so many times on set and he will never eat the food we have and i just know he brings his lunch he feels safe with his own food. He does not want our food. And, you know, he's very on the mark. So at, at 1230, if we said that's lunch, he's taking lunch. I don't care what you're in the middle of. He's walking out and getting his lunch bag, you know, but system is. Well, how safe is it to have a kid in a classroom with other kids who are not autistic? Now, this, this, this young person, actually, he's running the class when he's, <laughs> I mean, he's, <laughs> he's in charge. So He's taking control. <laughs> yeah and well, and and i you know and i feel for you because exactly the navigation of that you know <laughs> you know i have some of my friends teach at this school and i don't know how they do it it's just such diversity and they're running you know classes with 20 young people on the spectrum at the same time and i'm like how do you do it like it's amazing to me i can only you know manage one or two and then like you said the acclimation of someone who's neurotypical in them in a room of quote typicals um is a whole nother thing. So, but I think it's just about being sensitive. It's about paying attention. It's about paying attention to them and then building a trust relationship, I would say, with that young person so that if they do get scared, flustered, intimidated, worried, that you are one of the people they can go to. And that may take a minute. And I would also not be afraid to ask the parent because the parent has spent 10 years with that child and they will have an idea. And if you ask intelligent questions and go, how does your son, you know, learn the best? You know, how does he understand? Is he good at communicating? What can I, what can I, what notes do you have for me when it comes to how I can communicate or make your son feel safe or whatever, you know, or help set boundaries for him or with him? Um, so, the yeah. In the class, would you think that it's safer to have the parents in the class? With they the might be because a lot of times, you know, they're used to one person, even, or even if it's just in the beginning, like maybe the first couple of weeks, a mom might come or, you know, a mentor or whatever might come to help them to settle down and to realize it is a safe space so that they can then maybe connect with you more and you can kind of become that stabilizer for them when, when they need it. Um, but it is, it is a challenge and I, I'm sorry, there's no easy answers. All I can say is really pay attention. The more you pay attention, the more you'll start to see like, oh, you know, he's, he's not picking that up or he is picking that up. He's way smarter than I thought. And this is his way of skirting the system. Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm mama with some of them. I'm like, I know you, I know what you're capable of. Don't try to pull that on me. Cause they're smart. And sometimes the parent, they got them right there. And I'm like, mm -mm, 
this is Shanna you're dealing with now. I know what you're capable of. We're going to make that deadline, you know? Um, so it's kind of walking that fine line of, of challenging and, and loving and empowering all at the same time, but kudos to you for your work, Charlie. And if I can ever do anything to help you, let me know. How, how old are your kids? They're all around that age. No, my kids with? range from three to, to 16 right now. That you're working with? Yes. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Oh, I'd like to hear more about your work later. Hi, okay. Cameron. Yeah. Can I add a little bit to that, yes. Charlie? So Charlie, I'm an elementary art educator um, in a connecting rural county, and we have a few autistic students. And for them, I think the most important thing is to kind of establish comfort in a new environment first and foremost. And that's going to look really different for each kid. But, you know, and I probably wouldn't recommend that the parent stays with that student. It would probably be better for them to leave. And then just kind of over, I don't know how often you meet, maybe once a week or more, but over the course of those meetings, just letting that student become comfortable in the room. And they may not even be participating um, or creating, but just kind of like gaining that comfort letter level until they're able to participate, I would say is really important. And I'm but sure you know that- what? Oh, that's what I do naturally because I don't know what to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, it, it's really challenging and you're not sure what to do at all. And I'm, I'm sure the parent is very comfortable with that as well. Um, just letting the kid have a new experience because that's probably why they're there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. That helps a lot. Yeah. I think, I think that is important, like she's saying, and, and from someone who knows that she does. Um, yeah, you know, comfort comes in different ways. And I think, you know, whatever we can do to make that happen. Are there any other specific questions or anything? So some of the things that, um, and let's talk about, we can talk about challenges for a minute because that's what he's talking about, you know. Um, communication is a thing. And like, I've found that each person, um, it's a discovery with the communication process. And the communication can depend on the day or the mood or what the young person's going through, you know? And so like um, sometimes, and that's why I think awareness and like really watching and paying attention and listening to the young person is important because sometimes they'll be going through an anxiety moment because of something in their head that either might not even be real, might not be accurate, but it doesn't matter. It's real to them, right? And so I've had two instances in the last few weeks of one was an older, person on the spectrum who I was working with um, that was doing some work for me. And um, she had, she said, I, I really need to talk to you about something. I said, okay. And then I was like, super busy. She's like, okay, I'll talk to you tomorrow. We'll set a time. And then when we talked, she had gotten herself kind of really worried about something, thinking that um, I was working with this particular autism community that I was not, that do some things that are a little questionable to people who are in the autism community. And I was like, no, I have nothing to do with that organization. But she already had herself into this, like, are you working with these people? Because if you are, then it's this and it's that. And I was like, da, 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 da. let's, let's talk about it, you know, and we were able to talk it out and she's like oh thank goodness you're not and I'm like no no I'm not I never have and I never will um but it was like being you know being sensitive when they do speak out and say can I talk to you about this or or something scaring me or worrying me like to address that because you know again it's it's a very real concern and and just addressing that is important. Um, and then one of the young men that I work with, he's so sweet. He's like worried. He texted us the other day and he was just like, I just want you guys to know, and he's a good communicator, but he was like, I just want you guys to know that I had an emotional breakdown at my therapist's office because I was worried about October. And he's like, because I have now two jobs and my family wants to take me on vacation and I just don't know how I can do it all. <laughs> You know, we're just like, it was so sweet. And we just had to reassure him. We're like, you know what? As a working professional, you are taking vacations. You are allowed and encouraged. And so it became this whole talk on self-care. And we explained to him like, hey, you know, it's good for you to take a vacation with your family. And we are so excited that you're doing that. And we know that you're such a good communicator that you're going to tell us way ahead of time. We're going to prepare for the, you know, you not being in the, in the office during that time. 
it's going to be perfectly fine. And, you know, and we worked it all out and his, he was like, thank you so much. You relieved my anxiety, you know? And I was like, well, you sweetheart, you didn't need anxiety. So, so it's, it's like watching for things like that and just being sensitive and, and communicating those things that can just kind of change the environment and, and move forward. And it, those are learning opportunities. If you think about any, just even what we call typical relationships, there are always opportunities for us to learn. There are teachable moments. I had someone who used to use that term a lot and I love it. Teachable moments where is this a, you know, is this a crisis or is this a chaos? okay, for the moment it might be, but then can we turn this to a teachable moment where we learn and they learn, right? That's what it's all about. We're not going to do this perfectly. Like there's going to be mistakes made on every side. We're going to, we're figuring this stuff out. It is not, there is no handbook that says, this is how you do it. You know, it's just not one of those things. Um, so be prepared for the, the challenge and the journey. But I think it's really just about being open same thing we do with everything is just trying to be empathetic, trying to understand and trying to learn and communicate well, you know? Yes. You know, somebody said reading books from autistics is a great way to educate yourself. And that is correct. Um, But also, you know, one of the things I'm really intrigued by, um, and I see that Phoenix has jumped in, um, is in Canada, they, there was this team and they built this RV with a, um, with the, the experience a VR experience where you could experience what it was like to be on the spectrum. And they were taking that for teachers to, to experience. And I was like, that is incredible. To me, that is like the best use of virtual reality is when we can do empathy training for whatever, you know, can you imagine experiencing the world in, you know, me as a white woman, experiencing the world as a woman of color or, you know, experiencing the world as someone who's on the spectrum or all these things. Like, I think the more we can tap into each other's experience of the world, the better. That's where, you know, empathy grows. And so there are things out there. And that's a good point. Reading books by people who are on the spectrum, listening to music, listening to interviews and podcasts. I mean, the good thing is there is some positive change moving forward, opening doors to hear more voices of adults, especially that are on the spectrum. And I think it, they're, they're out there. We just need to seek them out and listen. And that's how we learn. You know, I'm continuously learning. I, I, I mean, I've been doing this for like six or seven years ongoing and with many different people on the spectrum. And I still feel like I know this much because it is absolutely a spectrum and it is absolutely a journey. You know, I mean, even when we people are supposed to be neurotypical, are we typical? Is there a typical? No, you know, it's like, we're all special. Humans are an interesting, we're an interesting bunch. So yeah. Anybody else? Uh, let's see. Have any advice for helping folks with autism navigate the intense moments of self-hate and crashes in self-esteem? You know, um, I think that goes for all of, I think it's the same advice for all of us is like the more, and that's why I think the arts is super important. It's one of the things that fuels me is the more we are all made to feel okay in our own skin and our voice to be heard and recognized by us and others and our, our perspective of the world, our experience of the world to come forward I think that's where we start to understand that we have an innate value in our space. And I think that's, to me, that's a huge thing that the arts can, that arts can do. Like you were talking about therapeutic arts, you know, Um, is providing opportunities for people to be elevated and voices to be elevated that we haven't heard from before and validating those with the elevation is like, Hey, you know, not only do you have something to say, but you have a right to say it. And I'm going to give you a platform and, and people are going to listen and experience and learn from you. Um, you know, the personal journey, something we all deal with, you know, um, I don't know. And again, I, you know, that's assuming that everyone feels that way. Um, I, I, I've dealt with people on the spectrum, young men who are quite confident, <laughs> you know, and they love themselves. It is not a, you know, this is not a one thing, just like humans are not one type that the spectrum is not one type, but I think the journey of understanding and, um, and elevating voices is where we, we help all of us to do that, you know? Um, and then like, like she was mentioning earlier, um, is just like changing the structural systems. So that it's not one way of doing things like, oh, you have to interview like this, or you have to show up at work like this, or you have to talk at the lunch table like this, you know, when are we going to allow people to just be themselves? I think we can, the more we can allow people to be themselves and function the way they like to function and they're comfortable, um, 
then they get comfortable in the space and then the space changes to fit them and not us having to change to fit the space. And we validate that you're okay. If you don't want to talk to me at lunch, that's fine. I'm just happy you're here. You know what I mean? And allowing that. And I've had to learn that. I've had to learn that because I'm, I'm kind of one of those people. I want everybody to be involved. I want everybody to experience what I'm experiencing, you know, and I've learned some people experience just by sitting back and, and observing and that's their gift. And I've learned to try to be more okay with that. You know, it has nothing to do with me. I try, you know, I so try to make it about me and it's not, it's about them and about their comfort and about the joy that they're getting from their life and, and everything. Um, anybody else? Let's see. I have knowledge from the get go. Yes. Some of my chats are disappearing. But yeah, I think um, are we, we're at 11.30. I think this is where we end or something. But um, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm going to put my website in here, but they're supposed to send you a handout that has all the resources that I talked about today and some links and things for you. Um, I'm on Instagram under my company name as well. And I am here in Chattanooga. I've relocated here. I bought a house here last year and I love it. So this is my home base now. Um, and I'm in the areas of um, music, film production, and, um, and children's storytelling and things like that. So if anybody is working in those realms, I'd love to connect with you and see what you're doing. Um, yeah. But yeah, feel free. And I'll put my email. My email is pretty much the same. It's just my company, Consulting at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to reach out um, and let me know what I can do to support your journey or if you're, you know, onboarding someone and I can help or whatever. Um, I appreciate it. But thanks for being here today, everybody. I think we're closing at 1130. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what's supposed to happen next. I think it's maybe lunch break or something. But um, I'll see you guys back this afternoon. Thank you, Joy, for your questions. Hi, Angela. <laughs> thanks, everybody. You guys have a good lunch. We'll Thank talk you, later. Shanna. Absolutely. Um, it's really great work that you're doing and we definitely need advocates out there to, to pull people in and carve out spaces and, and keep, you know, addressing that we, we can't silo people. Right. Differences. Right. Um, I just wanted to like, there was a, a, a significant, there was a, a, something that Phoenix had asked about someone oh, who is that. edging on suicidal thoughts. And I was just going to respond to that, that, I mean, that's a tough situation my only instinctual place and not from a counseling perspective at all, I'm a, an artist, but is, is, you know, validating just those initial feelings to start that conversation. If they're, if you're comfortable with that, I don't know, you know, suicidal thoughts have been great. Such a big thing about young people in our community, you know, that's on the pressing on the horizon and, um, I don't think it, you know, that's just my instinct. And I have had family members who, you know, have, have expressed those, had been, been in those moments of life. And I imagine, you know, you don't want to write, you know, ignore, not ignore, but right. We don't want to like, just say that's going to get better. I think validating yeah. it somehow. I don't know how, you know, but it's. Right. And I, I'm anyways, gonna... I just wanted to. Yeah. And I'm not a therapist either. So I can't give specific. And I actually, I lost my husband to suicide last year and it was completely unexpected. So I'm a firsthand survivor of that. And I can just tell you, I don't know, <laughs> you know, it is the mm -hmm. hardest thing to deal with when someone you think is just the most precious person in the world walks away. So, um, but all we can do is try to be aware, you know, but sometimes they don't even communicate it. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I have to leave that to the professionals and God, if there is one, <laughs> mm. but you know, it's, it's an individual journey. And I think the more we sink into self-love, the more we then emanate that into the world. And the more we have empathy for ourselves, the more we emanate that to the people around us. And so that's my goal is just to try to fall in love with myself every day so that I can just fall in love with everyone else at the same level. I think it starts here, you know, it starts here. So thanks everybody. Thanks, this one. Yeah. Have a good lunch. Thank you. Bye guys.
everyone. Thank you for coming back after lunch. We hope you had a wonderful lunch. We are uh, admitting folks that are back in and uh, signing them to some of their chosen breakout rooms. If you give just one moment, we will get started. Okay, welcome back everyone. We think, we hope <laughs> that you had a wonderful lunch break and that you're ready to jump into the next uh, session of five concurrent breakout sessions. 
Uh, we are thrilled to have five breakout sessions here for you to choose from that we have assigned you two rooms. Some as, as they're rejoining, we'll have to assign you as they rejoin. But for the next session, we have starting with all aboard, take the STEAM, S-T-E-A-M train from history to the 21st century with Kelly Kelly, STEAM teaching artist. We also have planning by doing short, short term wins for long term gains with Till Theobald and Erica Roberts of Glass House Collective. We have Chattanooga versus hip hop with Micah Chapman and the hip hop Chattanooga crew. We have faith in the arts from Reginald Smith at the Bethlehem Center. And we also have shifting from the top down to all around a rebranding story with Lori Allen, art based collaborative ABC at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and Angela Dittmar is joining her. We would like to remind all of our facilitators that once you are in your breakout room, you will need to um, share your screen and make sure that you include sound and video if you have that in your presentation. Also, to make sure to please record your breakout local, you will have that option as a facilitator as you are a co-host. If you have any questions, I'll put my phone number in the chat for you to text me during your breakout. James and I will both be jumping from uh, each breakout room to assist if needed. All right, is ever, if everyone is ready, we will go ahead and open the breakout rooms and please be patient as I have to assign a few folks. And uh, I want to go, did you, yes, sir. did you mention that you have to accept the invitation to go into the breakout room? No, thank you for saying that. Once I open all the breakout rooms, you will have a button pops up for you to accept it. So each of you will have to accept it to actually join the breakout room that you chose, okay? Thank you, James. All right, here we go.
I see, I know many of you on this call and you either work or run an arts organization. I'm sure you know how hard it is to receive grant money for businesses. Um, it's almost impossible. So we kind of found a, a loophole and created a grant program with the goal of driving foot traffic to businesses in our neighborhood while also creating paid gigs for local creatives. This grant opportunity supports the businesses along Glass Street by funding arts-based programming and installations. And in June, in June of 2021, we announced our four winners for the Art Means Business Grants. And these business owners have, at the time, six months to complete their projects. And those projects include art events, installations, and even, even a little bit of some holiday spirit. Glass House Collective believes in the power of arts and culture to strengthen the social and economic development of our neighborhood. This grant program is a great example of that. Tina, owner of Ashanti's Hair Designs, create a welcoming environment full of visual um, African culture with African food, vibes, live music, live mural painting of an African queen, while talented stylists were creating live art through hair on models. Tina has transformed her space that is rentable to the community into what felt like to me, a kid in a candy store, uh, complete eye candy. It was so incredible to see African-American Chattanooga history, local history. Um, and as an African-American woman, it was even more important to experience this event about hair and natural beauty, specifically from such a strong staple that's been in the community for decades. Also, the ending of this is that there's still possibilities. She still has funding to do a second one, so there's even more. Um, and speaking of decades, that she's been here for years. Glass House Collective started our work in North Chamberlain on the Glass Street intersection where Ms. Tina's building and business is located. About five years ago, the organization in partnership with residents began to work on the Dodson and Glass Street intersection to book in Glass Street with the improvements. And so, oh. Here's a sneak preview, a release this week exclusive. You guys are first to see this. Our new video diving into our most recent project at this intersection. And shout out to a local resident, Ms. Deborah Bledsoe, for blessing us with her beautiful voice as a soundtrack to this video. Enjoy for a moment. Good things have been growing across Glass Street, most recently a block long mural. Bringing sunshine to the streetscape sure has been a journey, and the seed was planted at a community workshop five years ago, where we heard loud and clear, it's time to create buzz around the Dotson and Glass Street intersection. Improving the infrastructure meant growing relationships. So a year later, we hosted Glass Street Live, bringing people, art, and activity together. And we kept the activity going with land surveys, people surveys, school surveys, so many surveys. Finding out exactly what the community wanted and what could take root was essential. Architects and community members created technical drawings to put in front of the city. And when that wasn't enough, we turned our plans into a real life installation. Still, there was some confusion around city funding, but instead of slowing down, our community rallied. Writing letters, reaching out to council members, making a case for the sidewalk, street trees, and lighting that we all wanted. And after some negotiations and meeting in the middle, we broke ground. Watching the community's design vision come to life and the opening of our new neighborhood grocery store was a huge win. But there was still a piece of the gateway that wasn't getting as much attention. And that's where Bloomberg Philanthropies came in. Together with matching local funds, we had plans to jumpstart a bold vision for this block. But then 2020. And we all know what happened in 2020. For the Glass Street community, this was the time to pivot. And pivot we did. 
taking engagement to the streets, fundraising for take-home art kits for our local elementary school, and finding ways to connect safely together, workshopping more ideas, going deeper into our shared priorities, and finding ways to work quickly and cheaply. With so much community design input, the gateway began to take shape. We saw pop-up galleries, fence art, creative safe routes, sculptural seating, a street park, and a bright new asphalt mural. When the world began to open up again, Glass Street was ready. Volunteer parties, block parties, we're all in this together parties. And this is just the beginning. Together, we'll continue to grow good things in our community, helping make Glass Street cleaner, safer, and more inviting for all. That video highlights completely the work that we started and are still working on in our community. But let's dive a little bit deeper. And y'all know, most of y'all know me, most of y'all know me really well and know that I'm always going deep. What if a visioning effort built in the next steps and unfolded while we were implementing projects together? Planning by doing workshops. Our planning by doing workshop was developed to create tangible plans from teams of residents, architects, planners, and artists to implement tactical urbanism projects that make Glass Street cleaner, safer, and more inviting as a testing ground to improve a busy commercial intersection. Each team focused on a different community priority previously identified through community engagement efforts from beautification to safe routes to schools to community gathering spaces. Teams conducted project uh, brainstorming sessions, refinements and public presentations. And then finally, each of those groups was given a $3,000 budget to implement at least one of their ideas. And this is how they brought those ideas to life. This team, headed up by a local resident and artist, Tucson, who's a friend of mine, created a walk of fame near the area's rec center to encourage use of sidewalk designed by local students honoring area and its heroes. In addition to the safe route element, they created an outside art gallery along the nearby fence featuring work from local elementary school students. From wheat pasting to paint stencils to yarn art, this project used creative interventions to help slow down traffic and mark safe walking routes for elementary students going to and from our new grocery store and the rec center. And this team identified seating, tables, shade, and planters and art elements to fill their ideal community gathering space. It was originally slated for a vacant lot behind the new grocery store, but the team worked with the city and created a temporary linear street park in the middle of the road um, next to the <laughs> asphalt mural to create a more narrow street for cars and focus more on people. The word love was chosen by residents and the rest came together by the help of volunteers. Yes, this was more than $3,000 as it became a piece of our asphalt mural project. A gateway installation, art installation that featured quotes and ambitions from the community helped add another fun and playful element to the block. The workshop had engagement prompts built in that the artists used for direction from community members as they were designing their concepts. Then 300 surveys were completed that chose the design. All of these teams projects helped to create interest and excitement around the asphalt mural. Then we all came together at a safe distance, of course, to celebrate the projects at a block party in April. Here's what went into this project. A lot, a lot of years, engagements, projects, activity, relationships. We're proud of our collective work, especially during this pandemic. Like many organizations, we came to our work 
with a textbook and best practices and case studies passed down to us through other placemakers and community engagement leaders. Mm -hmm. But from day one, we've seen that instead of bringing often flawed conventional wisdom to this work, mm -hmm. we need to unlearn lessons of the past and relearn the lessons of this community, our community. In our decade working in Glass Farm, we've had our assumptions checked, our approaches questioned, and our beliefs reframed. And honestly, it's always helped us do better. Here are just a few of the lessons that we've unlearned, reframed, and dispensed along the way. Listening. It's greater than action. Instead of seeing actions as a measure of our success, we've invested in listening. And that's the most difficult, powerful, innovative piece of work that we could ever do. Once we built this foundation, we started moving into action, but used that same action as a platform for continued listening, for example. This took place while I was doing engagement in our local elementary school, shout out to Hardy. We heard from previous engagements that a safer and more connected intersection was a priority. But what we heard specifically from those kids in that class was that they were unclear on where to cross, what the safest route would be, and how to use the crosswalks effectively. And you know, we can't even assume anything about this work. So listening through engagement has to be a personal priority key to creating those solutions together. Design for everyone or design with everyone? It's been said design is for everyone, but we've learned that design is for everyone only when it's with everyone. When every neighbor and partner has a say in design, it's no longer a prestigious product. Instead, it becomes a strategic tool for progress. An example, one example of this is that we've made urban design and planning work more fun and engaging than the typical charrette survey style. Um, and we've done that through our cross-disciplinary workshops that provide creative prompts and utilize creative artists who engage team members on the front end and throughout the process, instead of just hiring the artists after all the decisions have already been made, it is a part of the final product, which we know happens, unfortunately, too often. Um, this leads us to our next lesson. Process equal product. And again, you guys are my friends, so you know me. And I'm always consistently saying, trust the process, bake it in. We've been told that as an arts organization, our final product had to be something concrete and lasting, a landmark in a community that symbolizes change. But what we've learned is that our process, engaging the artist, making the art, sharing the art, and then collecting feedback around art and from that art was more important. For example, our engagement in the school that I spoke of early abruptly ended due to COVID-19, of course. We quickly responded by launching a fundraiser to secure art kits for every student so that they can continue art while at home. And yes, of course, we stuck in a coloring book and we hope that it would assist with the direction for our future projects. But what really was important and mattered the most to us was that the kids and the school felt our support regardless of what our original intended um, outcome would have been. Capacity is greater than control. At its core, placemaking is about building a community's capacity to define its own sense of place. And that can happen through engagement and investment. From our early days, we felt that this community-driven work was more important and meaningful than top-down. We often see so many communities see top-down investment, real estate transaction, and a lot of power, and we have we don't own any properties on Glass Street and we we thought that building capacity within our neighbors was stronger than maintaining control and an example of that is that just one example is in this scenario is that we gave co-facilitators for this workshop that we've been talking about both an artist and an architect three thousand dollars to create their own project so that the type A of the leadership and the crew actually had to step back, right? And it means that when we step back, the product may not look as we originally intended. Um, but now like, that's actually our goal. That's what we hope for. Temporary installations and experiences can lead to permanent improvements. They're a great opportunity to provide a vision for what could be 
and gauge the interest of their communities. For example, at this intersection, we started with block parties where we gather input and then advocated for new sidewalks and street trees. Next, we planted trees and put in creative crosswalks ourselves. And now we have official crosswalks. City installed trees and sidewalks and a bright new asphalt mural. We're testing this community space now, like literally right now, to get community input for a permanent structure here. The best way we know is to test. So at this very moment, while we're here enjoying your company, there is some gathering, there's some music, there's full art happening literally blocks away. Surveys don't say it all or do it all. As you know, we are born out of a strong community tradition here, community surveying tradition here in Chattanooga. But respectfully, we think a survey can only go so far. We believe it's important to have face-to-face -face conversations with neighbors on an ongoing, consistent, casual basis. And most importantly, to demonstrate follow through. An example of this is even when we are required to do surveys through grants, which is pretty often and was specific in this case because we received the Bloomberg grant. Um, we, instead of us doing those, we hired local residents to conduct them so that they would have more meaningful, meaningful conversations with their neighbors during the survey process, um, which leads us to the next slide. Partnership is greater than a single organization. A single organization cannot responsibly take on the work of a community with diverse challenges. Rather than building the capacity of one organization to meet Glass Farms forever evolving community goals, we believe in partnering with experts outside our four walls, for example. For our most recent workshop, we partnered with AIA of Chattanooga and the Chattanooga Design Studio. We did not partner with the city of Chattanooga. We made it clear that we plan to ask for forgiveness <laughs> for those technical projects instead of permission. We did, however, partner with the city on the Bloomberg funded Asphalt Art Initiative. We learned a lot about that partnership, but that's for another presentation on another separate day. Okay, local experts, not just consultants. Um, residents of our Glass Farm neighborhood, they're the local experts and they're the placemakers and it's important to invest in their time. We believe in paying neighborhood residents, artists and project leaders. After all, time is money. Uh, we paid stipends to every community member um, at the workshop and emerging artists and facilitators who attended the workshop. The architects that Erica mentioned earlier through our partnership with AIA work pro bono, but we had to pay some of them in the end because they put so much time and effort and passion to these projects and it was only fair. We should have included them in the original budget and that's a lesson that we continue to learn. Um, but partnerships are great and compensation to individuals always help prioritize projects. Artists will come here. No, artists are here already. We have seen countless cases of organizations successfully relocating artists to neighborhoods to inject investment and creativity in revitalization efforts. We believed it was more important to build the capacity of artists who are already living here or grew up in the neighborhood rather than bring outsiders in. We are learning as we go, but one thing that I know for sure is that artists are the one asset that exists in every community. For example, we invited artists to apply for a recent asphalt mural and a part of that process was working with and mentoring a young black artist from the community that was previously involved through our planning by doing workshop. It was a collaborative effort and now both Tucson and Kevin Bate have something that they are proud of. And most importantly, the community at large has something that they too are very proud of. Hopefully guys, I hope that you heard something today on how to connect neighbors, how to connect designers and artists like me together to solve public space challenges and to create an amazing roadmap for short-term projects that lead to long-term change as well as taking note of all the lessons that we have shared with you and that you can also pass on. Thank you for your time. If you have a moment, you can click on that QR code to take a deeper dive into the work that we have been doing and what we continue to do. Um, if you have any questions,
Let's go, y'all. Let me know. We got some chats while we were speaking to how amazing gorgeous beautiful i think they're talking to the, about the video it's really neat courtney said unlearn and relearn i was listening i, I think leah laughed when you said about the city <laughs> and then Elizabeth said preach this was something that was really amazing to work to see how it all came into fruition um honestly stepping into the classroom march 12th of 2020 was when I was at Hardy. And if you remember, it was that week that we were, there are a lot of things were gonna be changed completely. But I was in that classroom with those third, fourth and fifth graders all day. And it was very obvious, um, their questions and they needed someone to listen. Yes, I walked into that, that classroom with a pat, with a map and crayons and I was ready to ask them what colors you wanna see on Crutchfield. And they answered that of course, but what was deeper was the fact that there was another need and that's listening to the community. Even though they're little people, they were a strong part of the community and they were able to tell me what they couldn't do, how they couldn't know how to cross. One kid said he was really nervous about crossing at this particular spot. And so it made us look at the crosswalks differently. Also realized as an adult, I may not know how to use them crosswalks right because they were looking kind of crazy. So, um, and it made us figure out a way to um, build around that, but also listen to what the community would want. And then when you see those things actually come into fruition, safe walks, so we put those actual um, wayfinders and then seeing where um, wanting a gathering space. So now, even though it's temporary, it doesn't feel very temporary, even though it is, it doesn't feel like it because it is, created a space that people come to. Drive by and you'll see someone standing there. Um, right now there are food truck, two food trucks that were one food truck and someone else selling stuff there. Um, there is music, live painting, um, all up at that love space. And it all came from listening to the community, from architects, residents, all in one group during a really hard time. And that's amazing to see that complete fruition, that complete evolution and seeing it literally, I can go touch that idea. And that's amazing. Nice to meet you ladies. I've heard great things about your work. I live in East Ridge. Look forward to connecting somehow soon for sure. Rachel East Ridge here too. Our city could learn much from this on civic engagement. I think that you guys are working with Thrive East Ridges. I saw something recently. Um, so we're, Oh, I am. I'm sure you are too. Are you happy to talk mm -hmm. with you guys mm -hmm. or, um, you know, share some of these lessons as well. It's been, you know, some hard lessons learned over almost a decade. So if we can expedite y'all's process by sharing some failures, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're absolutely happy to do that. Yeah, we, we don't want to see anybody <laughs> have to take the lesson the hard way. Hey, ladies. <laughs> Hey, hey Leah. I was just gonna ask y'all too. I should know this. I know and love you both. But um, Black Street Collective has been there. You said almost a decade. Mm -hmm. We started. Right. We started our work in 2012. That's crazy. What? And I know it took like it probably took that long to get to where you guys are at right now, as far as like trusted in the community, like people know you guys and you guys get that stuff done. But what is like the biggest lesson that you've learned, like over these? has several years like what is something that's like right. always gonna be in the back of your head like every time you make a decision like no because this happened you know like what's the, that one thing <laughs> I know for me it's been make no assumptions um if what I'm about to do is going to affect a community I must ask myself the question first did I listen to the community? Did I ask them anything? Because it's very easy to just be like, okay, so I'm gonna do it. And you think it's an amazing work, but if the community didn't want it, then you just annoyed everybody. You didn't do it the right way. So for me, it's been honoring the fact that the expert is the resident, is the community and being able to listen to them. Um, and support them. Absolutely, absolutely. And not, not do it for them, do it with them. I think 
I agree with Erica. When we first showed up, uh, we were three blonde hair, blue eyed, white kids. Um, and we didn't have a un strong understanding of the history or the community in which we were engaging. And so um, I'd say that, you know, we came in with this great idea to light up some of these storefronts that were all vacant. And we shared this with the neighborhood association and they basically told us to take our asses home, <laughs> excuse my French, but, um, you know, they, like Erica said, they didn't want, you know, who are we to come into their community to tell them what they should do. And I think, unfortunately, it's, that's very common. Um, and so we kind of learned the hard, hard way. And I guess, fortunately, I'm stubborn as heck, if you know me. And so, you know, out, we just, sh we shelved our, our plans for an entire year and just really went on a listening tour and the listening tour didn't look like just come to community meetings in our building. It also looked like drinking bud heavies on porches and showing up at, you know, cul-de-sac basketball tournament parties in the middle of the street and talking with somebody's granny who's lived here their whole life. And so I just think, you know, it's, it's so easy to think that, oh, okay, you know, we're going to build Build trust so we'll do a few engagements or we'll host a few meetings like it took an entire year and I would say it's like I still haven't gained the complete trust of this neighborhood and that's fair because there's there's decades and decades and decades of mistrust right um but I also think that it's it's also fair to not also just put somebody that looks like the community in a community engagement role um because A, you're tokenizing that person if you're only using them in that space um, because they look like the community, because quite frankly, the community has also not welcomed those folks in as well if they don't have trust with them. I think the trust is a little bit easier to build, but it's still it still takes so much time and effort, and it's so hard to include that time um, into grants because it's not, you know, the typical outcome. So I, I agree with Eric on that, but then the other element I would add on to it, which I think could be relevant for the folks in East Ridge is that, um, so often when you're looking at kind of underserved communities, it's so overwhelming. There's so many needs, right? Like we could, we could, you know, affordable housing, you know, sidewalk, street lights basic infrastructure, access to health care, access to food. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of need and we, you can get really overwhelmed in that space. And so I think something that a big takeaway for me is just like celebrating the good and, and sticking to it and like doing some, what planners called asset-based development, but it's, it's just highlighting what is working and what is good. And sometimes it's just the people. Sometimes it's, creative folks sometimes it's a church in a block you know it looks different in every community but I think really digging in and shining light on that and kind of sharing a positive narrative instead of we need more affordable housing or we need better access to transportation is a way to get folks that live here excited and mm -hmm. then they get on board to help with the transportation mm -hmm. issues and stuff but we're, we all, especially now, have so much on our shoulders. The world is heavy. And to come out and just always talk kind of negatively about what is wrong isn't an approach that I feel like um, is helpful. It's counterproductive. If that's no, that good. was great. Those are great responses. And I really want to incorporate like that into my new position now. And even in what I do in my own community at Rosemary Drive, how I could be eight. Um, I have to be a community of growing too. Um, so yeah, Dr. Jones, that's great work. I'm so proud of y'all. Good to see y'all too. You too. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? I do appreciate your time today. Thank you for um, being with us today. Um, and listening. Hopefully there are some strong lessons that will last and help you see the community that you live in differently or community that you work in differently. Um, and it may spark you to do something different as well. 
Um, it's a rewarding space, but it's not easy work. Still got to do it. Thank you, guys. What time was the keynote speaker going on? Is that two? No. Yeah. Two or one forty-five. One forty-five, maybe. Leah, do you know? I was trying to look at the agenda they sent earlier, but I can find it. But please feel free to um, hit us up if you're interested in, you know, learning more. Um, and then, you know, there there are things that are coming up in the. Oh, yeah, why don't we share some upcoming stuff? Yeah. Yeah, we have some really some really cool stuff. So every Friday, that same love gathering space that we were talking about earlier, that was built through in the planning by doing workshop. Um, there is a like not a concert, but just um, some nice pop up kind of vibe um, every Friday from now up until October 22nd. And it is from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And it's with DJ uh, MC Pro, um, John Moore. Um, today there was a mu musician and a singer and at every one on Friday, all of those ha has an artist that's painting live. So today, Andrew Travis is painting. Um, he's doing all of for the month of October. And they're always like, they're kind of gonna be like a series. And then in October, we are hopefully gonna be able to launch out a volunteer day where we come out and clean up the asphalt mural spot there. And then most people know that then there's the block party that has been happening in Glass, Glass Street for how many years? A long time, seven years. Uh, yeah. um, and so it's Glass Street Live, that's November 6th. And that's like um, a celebration of the community. So, you know, businesses come out and they do their thing. We have a stage and we have musicians and um, we look forward to seeing what this is gonna be like um, for this year. Um, because we have some new faces to introduce. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun, November 6th, and it's Glass Street Live. Looking for volunteers, you guys can come hang too. If y'all wanna, <laughs> um, if you're interested in planning or um, have somebody that you wanna get involved to do a mural or sell or vend or anything, there we're gonna be meeting out here on Thursday at 5.30 at 25, 130 North Chamberlain. Why did my mind just go blank? 2501. Uh, the intersection of Glass Street and North Chamberlain. Um, thir this Thursday at 530. And we would love, we're kind of, last year we did the event by committee. Um, and so it was great. And we would love to do that again. So if you're interested, pop over here at outside Mass. Um, and we're going to be kind of figuring out how we want to do Glass Street Live the first weekend in November together. Yep, yep. Thank you, guys. I don't know what happens when we end early. Do we just? I don't even know. <laughs> Thanks for sending that email. Hi, Doggett. Is it Shana yeah. or Shanna? Sounds like Shanna. Hi guys, sorry, it's uh, Shanna. Shanna. <laughs> Wait, let me get to the right camera. Shanna from Louisiana. Oh, nice. Shanna nice from Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah. That's got a good little ring to it. I like Most it. Most people remember it. <laughs> it's nice okay. to meet you all. Thanks for your work. I've heard so many great things about you guys. I'm so glad to see you. How are you Amazing. Too? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I guess if we don't have any more questions, um, we'll just kind of mute and you guys should sing our interpretive dance. <laughs> you can sing. That's my vibe, right? No. <laughs> y'all don't, don't need that kind of problem. Y'all go like, recite another poem? No, I'm good. I'm out. <laughs> we actually, um, it is an art conference and it is Friday. That's funny. <laughs> You're right. 
Uh, we also have a DJ and some really good pulled pork that has my name on it down the street, activating that love space that we've been talking about. So I think we'll, if we're ending yeah. early, we may head down there. Absolutely. Um, it's too bad. I think the conference was supposed to be in East Chattanooga before the Delta. Um, so it's a bummer that we all can't be in this space together, but y'all come down and have lunch with us um, every Friday until October 22nd. Um, and then October 22nd, we're actually going to be part of Startup Week. Oh yeah, with Leah. So hot dog it. Maybe October 22nd, you guys could throw on your calendar and come have lunch with us. Please. Um, that'd be great. So we're going to head down there. I guess what we'll just take our video off mute. And then when they go back to the main room, I guess we'll come out of our breakout room. Sorry, we don't really know what to do when we end early because we never, ever, <laughs> ever, ever end, end early. So that's the funny part too, because we were like, we were worried, you know, um, most of you guys, if you y'all know me, know me, I am probably the most long-winded poet ever. And so like this script was y'all's friend. It kept, you know, kept us, you know, you know on a straight and narrow. And so now we have all this extra time. I don't know what to do with it. And I'm excited about it. Court. <laughs> hey, Court. Hey, Court. What's going on, Courtney? Court was in our Sway class. We could tell you guys about that really fast. So uh, in 2019, Court was one of the first to go through. We created back to that lesson learned that I was talking about with the building capacity stronger than maintaining control. A part of that is like when we decided, okay, we're not going to have any control over the real estate. We really want to build capacity of the neighbors and artists and support both of them. So we partnered with Caleb, not the dude, it's an organization. Um, and they uh, it created um, a curriculum based off of the Gamaliel Foundation. That's who Obama trained with um for community organizing and so it's called sway a people's guide to community organizing if you've gone through co-starters or cause start cause starters it's similar like you know x amount of sessions um you've got your book you've got your mm -hmm. curriculum and you've got a cohort right and so um court was one of the artists the way we set it up is half residents or community stakeholders and then half uh, citywide artists um and we really want to build the community organizing muscle of our artists um, to help support the, the folks on the ground doing the work. Um, and so, yeah, Courtney, who's in this call, um, was one of our guinea pigs. And then we just finished our second Sway group. You can find out about that program. I think it's swayguide.org. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also email us because the whole point of us setting it up and kind of doing two pilot runs over here is that we would love to take it to other communities. Um, so we're trying to figure it out. Um, we were really hoping that it could be a program where you're kind of doing by learning. Um, oh, Court said it was life altering, 100% recommend, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we were hoping, and Court knows that you kind of are learning by doing kind of what our presentation was about today, but there was so much in that curriculum that it's, it was really hard to add a doing demonstration project um, while learning. And so right now we're kind of pitching it as more of a community organizing one-on-one -on -one platform, like a class. Um, and I think that by doing that and doing it online now too, because of COVID, mm -hmm. it can become more accessible. And so for the folks in East Ridge or for just, you know, staff at the Hunter, um, teachers, planners, uh, let us know because we're, we're happy to connect you with Michael Gilliland and kind of get that going. So thanks Court for saying that. Thank you. Leah left. All right, well, y'all have a good Friday and um, hope to see you down on Glass Street soon. If not, uh, November 6th or 5th? 6th. 6th, we'll see you there. Bye. Bye, y'all.
All right. <clears throat> Welcome back, everyone. And we hope that you enjoyed the sessions today, the opening speaker. And um, here we are for the last part of the conference uh, this afternoon. And we are so excited because it's going to be a special thing that's going to happen. Um, we actually have Dr. Nkeshi el -Amin, Alana Norwood from the Black and Appalachia podcast, which many of you have probably heard of or seen. Um, they were recently featured in the New York Times and other publications uh, around the country. And they are going to be doing a live podcast featuring Dr. Roland Carter, who's the Professor Emeritus of Music at UTC, um, live from the small conference room here at Arts Build. Um, and it's an honor for us to be the host of this and to be able to bring this to all of the conference participants today. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to say again, thank you and how much we appreciate you for joining us. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Stratton and the team of uh, um, Black and Appalachia so that they can take over. And I'll come back with some final words at the very end. What's up Chattanooga? What's up Chat Town? <laughs> what a lovely day it has been so far. Thank you all so much for inviting us to be a part of this very first Arts Bill Equity in the Arts Conference. Um, as folks who followed James and the works of Arts Build, uh, we are delighted to be here and to share and to learn with you all. I am Dr. Nkeshi Alamine. I'm a sociologist of race and place and Black Appalachian experiences. My name is Alana Norwood. I am the co-host for this podcast and community archivist for the Black and Appalachia Initiative. And you all are experiencing the, the Black, Black and Appalachia, Appalachia podcast. podcast. So just to give you a little bit of background about us, uh, the Black and Appalachia Initiative is a research, education, and support organization that works in collaboration with East Tennessee PBS, residents, university departments, libraries, archives, and community organizations to highlight the history and contributions of African Americans in the development of the Mountain South and its culture. We do that through research, local narratives, public engagement, and exhibition. Black in Appalachia is a community service for Appalachian residents and families with roots in the region. And so usually when people think about or hear about Appalachia, we're not exactly who they think about, right? And so we developed this podcast as a way, as an extension of, of our larger project, as a way to get the narratives of Black Appalachian people into the forefront of our conception um, of Appalachia. So we want black, we want folks to think about Black folks when they think about Appalachia as well, right? Um, we also want to be a reflection and a representation of Black life in the region. Um, for people who are from the region, people who have familiar ties to the region, and people who just want to know about Appalachia. The Black and Appalachia podcast is a production of Public Radio Exchange and East Tennessee PBS, and we launched a year ago. And so our podcast is a chat style podcast, so we, um, and we tell historical stories, contemporary stories, stories that bridge the historical and the contemporary. Um, we challenge misconceptions of the region while highlighting Black people and Black places, and we do all of this while having a good time. So first, before we get into the business of this conference, uh, we just want to acknowledge that we are in Chattanooga, like literally in in house at Arsville's building, um, and we're really excited to be here. Chattanooga and Knoxville has this um, interesting re relationship, and we feel like you all are like our second cousins who went away and never come back. <laughs> don't ever come visit us. We don't see y'all, but we still have lots of love for you, and and we miss you. So it's really nice to be able to connect with folks in in Chattanooga and to be here in person. And you know, we know that folks are iffy about claiming Appalachia because there's this whole stereotype of poor white mountain folk. Um, that's just the image of the region, but Appalachia does have cities like Chattanooga, so 
that makes y'all a part of Appalachia too. <laughs> and so speaking of Chattanooga being a part of Appalachia, um, I can't tell, I can't tell y'all how proud I was um, when um when I, I was talking to James and Monica in preparation for this conference and James said something, he, he said that he was a fan of the podcast and that this is one of the only places where um, he hear people who sound like him. And that just really resonated with me because usually when we think of Chattanooga, it's just sort of associated with the South, not Appalachia. And so that really, um, you know, just really felt good like, like that folks here can see themselves in the work that we're doing. So as we said, we are so happy to be here. Uh, thank you guys for having us. Uh, we are based further in East Tennessee, Knoxville is, whereas Chattanooga is more of the, the Southern part of East Tennessee. It's nestled in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, and it is the fourth largest city in the state and is located on the border of Georgia, but y'all already know all that. Yes, y'all know that, but just for our listeners, we wanna make sure they know where Chattanooga is and um, what we're talking about. So usually when people think about Chattanooga, they think of the Tennessee Aquarium or Bessie Smith or the Chattanooga Choo Choo, um, Lookout Mountain, Mountain, hand gliding and all kinds of outdoor activities. I know for me, the last time I was here was to go visit Ruby Falls. Um, and so, of course, uh, I'm sure that you all get a lot of energy around the falls. Uh, people who love outdoors definitely love Chattanooga. I want to give a shout out to my girl, Becca. She stays on the trails. Uh, but seriously, y'all, like, this is such a scenic city. Um, I'm sure the folks from Chattanooga, y'all all have your own things that you associate with your city. So feel free to drop some things that you like to do in the chat box below. For sure. And we are not at, are able to see the chat, but we definitely will take a look at some of those things. And I think that, you know, regardless of what you all drop in that chat, in that chat, I feel like after our time here and, um, you know, hanging out with the Arts Build crew last night, for us, Chattanooga is going to be known as Hospitality City. We had a great time. So thank you all for showing us love. Shout out to the Arts Build crew and shout out to Chef Kenyatta for that amazing food at Neutral Grounds last night. So good. Okay, so now for the business. Okay, so when, you know, when we were invited to speak at this conference, uh, we thought about the idea um, of equity in the arts, right? And we thought about where do we hear conversations about equity? And we realized that these are usually, when we, when we hear people talk about equity in the arts, these are usually conversations about funding, right? Um, they're usually conversations about why funders should fund black and brown and other marginalized communities. Um, and it's kind of crazy because these conversations happen about every five years or so, as if you know the last time we had these conversations, things weren't clear enough, right? But it just keeps coming in these cycles, right? Um, and it's kind of it, it goes with you know something tragic happens, and then people remember like, oh yeah, we should probably fund black people, or we should we should fund queer people, or we should fund poor people, right? And then things die down, they forget about us, and then you know something happens again, and it's just you know even though. We have research um, that has shown the challenges that we know what's going on. We know what um, we know about these disparities and inequalities in, in funding and in, in the arts. Um, you know, we still have to go through these exhausting and often dehumanizing cycles, right? And so when we thought about these cycles and we, we thought about these funding conversations, we realized that what is at the root of these issues is power, right? Um, there's a power imbalance. And we often place the power within the hands of the funders, the foundations, the ones who hold and control the capital. But the reality is that while funders get elevated in this way, the real work happens on the ground in our communities. Um, in our communities, we are very aware of the significance of art and culture. We know how vital it is uh, to our lives, our institutions, our movements. We infuse them in our work. We rely on them to do our work. And they're really a part of our care infrastructure um, and how we make our mark on the world. And so as we are thinking about these things, we started to imagine how might things be different if there was a shift in power, right? Um, whereby the power was understood to be held in, by the communities, right? The cultural workers, the creatives, the artists, rather than um, funders deciding what art is and who can produce art, um, it's actually the ways that communities use creative practices and cultural practices to build, to revolutionize and to transform our world. 
right? So what if we thought about these things and we placed the power there? How might these conversations look differently? How might the things that we do um, be different, right? How, how would things be different if we think about funders being made relevant only by the work that, they're fund, that they fund? And so, you know, we don't want to get too carried away on this funding path, um, but we definitely want you guys to think about these things. Uh, but now we're going to go ahead and shift the conversation to center the amazing work that comes out of our communities. Uh, we want to highlight the people who actually do the work um, that changes lives. We often, we're talking about people who are working magic. Okay, because with even the limited resources that we have access to, they make a way to do evolutionary and revolutionary work. Right. And when it comes to culture and arts contributions of Black people in Chattanooga, there's so much rich history um, and so much amazing work that's happening right here in this city, right? So we just had a chance to meet um, the young men that were um, a part of the hip hop collective and really were excited to hear about all the things that they're doing. Um, but today we want to focus um, our talk on uh, contributions made by a Black Chattanoogan that goes beyond this Appalachian city. So when we say beyond, I mean, we mean nationally and even on a global scale. Um, I don't know any Black American who is not familiar with the Negro National Anthem titled Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, we might not all, we might not know all the words, <laughs> but we all know somebody that can sing that song <laughs> and bring you to tears. It's definitely an emotional, an emotion inducing experience to hear the song, right? Um, it gives us a sense of pride um, and hope as Black people who are living in America. And we know the challenges um, that we face uh, as Black folks in America. Um, and I think that what people usually don't know about the song is that a Black Chattanoogan gave us the version that we all know and love. That's right. Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is often affectionately referred to as the Black National Anthem or the Negro National Anthem, whichever way. Um, it was written in 1900 by James Weldon Johnson and composed in 1905 by his brother J. Rosamond Johnson. But a little over 50 years ago, Chattanooga na native Dr. Roland Carter, who actually grew up in a segregated Black community during Jim Crow, and whose musical talent was cultivated and supported in his community, did the arrangement of the song that we all know. So um, I think we're going to play a little clip of that. Yes. We're not getting sound from it. Okay. The, uh... Is that it? Okay. No worries. Technology is great when it works for us, and we are just going to keep it rolling. Okay, I should sing a little bit for y'all, but <laughs> okay, you guys, you come today. on now. <laughs> Not today. Um, but you all know the song. We've all heard it. You know, many of us grew up, if you um, if you attended Black schools, especially, you grew up singing the song at school or at least, um, if not every day, um, definitely on special occasions, we heard the song, we sang the song. I know for me, when I was in high school, uh, we were assigned to learn and recite the song in my ninth grade English class. I will never forget it, Mr. Ingram's class. Um, and, and, you know, being someone who migrated to the United States, 
um, only a few years earlier, it's definitely something that I think about when I think about what it, my experience of developing an African-American identity. Wow, and Keshi, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, again, for thank you for reminding us of the impact arts and culture has on our lives. But you know what's really amazing? What's amazing? The fact that we have Dr. Carter here with us in the building, ready to share with us today. How awesome. And so <clears throat> I'm so, <laughs> so caught <laughs> in the moment. I almost forgot my life. Um, but it, it is definitely a pleasure, Dr. Carter, to have you here. Um, Dr. Roland Carter has devoted his life to preserving Black folk music and the um, and its identity in African American culture um, through his teaching, conducting, composing, and arranging of choral music. Um, he is Professor Morenis at the University of Chattanooga. Please help me in welcoming to the virtual stage, Dr. Roland Carter. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yes. Um, it's, been, um, it's been fun just getting to know you while we were waiting for things to get um, set up. And we're so excited to, to jump into some questions with you. Um, one of the things that we want to kick things, kick, the, kick off the conversation with is really kind of thinking about to thinking, thinking about your childhood. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where in Chattanooga you grew up and how arts and culture um, shaped the community that you lived in? Well, I grew up in an area called Bushtown. Uh, that's just off of East Third and uh, Greenwood Avenue, Hostel, uh, right behind the new speedway there. <laughs> Actually, my home, I was born in the house that's still there. Wow. And uh, so, uh, and I spent all of my life, uh, well, until my parents died, uh, even when I came back 30 years later in, in 1989 to the university, my parents were still living in the home place. So it was Bushtown, and uh, the, the main part about this is that I, I composed a piece called, uh, what, 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 what? Boy, I've forgotten the name of the piece. I got uh, uh, common ground, and and the reason I called it common ground was because just the cross in front of my house was uh, Warner Park. Warner Park used to be the white amusement park. Mm. So I could sit there and look and see the ball games and the, all the fairs. And and we have when they had the state fairs, we had. Blacks had one night a week that they could go to the state fair mm -hmm. and want to park. But now, mind you, Chattanooga had a black amusement park that's over by where uh, Erlanger Hospital is, Lincoln Park. Mm -hmm. So we had our own park, but everything was separate. So I, I, I compose this piece, Common Ground, because uh, it, it said we were in an area together, but not together right you know right. and that was a, an important part but growing up in Chattanooga uh, I started my music studies uh, probably around the age five uh, my mom tells me I used to come home from church at the age of four and climb up on the piano stool and tried to play what I had heard in church. So that was where they recognized that I may have had a little talent. Uh, music was all around me. My aunt was a gospel choir, had a group called Wings Over Dixie, a group of ladies who sang gospel music all over the South. And they rehearsed at my house every night, every Monday night. Mm -hmm. And so I've had it, my brothers and sisters, I'm the last of five. Uh, my brothers and sisters all, all took piano. There was a time I, I think East Side was sort of, sort of centered or considered a kind of um, quote uppity part of, <laughs> of the black community. <laughs> but no, but sincerely, uh, we were all made to take piano lessons. That was something mm -hmm. everybody did you know, uh, as growing up as kids. But um, so that's how I got started. And I had a neighborhood teacher, Alma Stovall. I think she must have taught every 
black person in Chattanooga because you had to wait forever to get a lesson whenever you had that. There was no appointment. If you lesson at three o'clock after school, you get, I get home six thirty seven o'clock for dinner. Yeah. And it was less than five blocks from my wow. house. But uh, that's where she taught an awful lot of people and, and was a great impact on my career as a teacher, my first piano teacher. Awesome. And thank you for sharing that experience with us. Um, can you share any more specific stories on how um, art and cultural workers in your community inspired your work? Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, my first grade teacher, uh, elementary music teacher, Janie Holder, was a graduate of Hampton University. So uh, little did I know about that during elementary school, but uh, I, I do want, know one thing about Janie Holt is she had long hair down her back and was a pretty lady. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that was, a, but, but a fine music teacher also. But, uh, and, and she got me involved in an awful lot of things. I remember one of the things she got me involved was a, competition with the Chattanooga Symphony. It was a, a, a question uh, among, among junior high school, uh, elementary junior high school kids uh, from public schools in Chattanooga. And I was only the minority student who was participating at that time and uh, won my first LP from the Chattanooga Symphony, the Unfinished Symphony Schubert uh, as a second prize winner. I didn't win the contest, but, uh, and then there were all kinds of other things. I mean, there were people, there was soprano uh, Mary Robbs, who was a great soprano from Chattanooga. And of course we grew, grew up with all the music on ML King. Mm -hmm. uh, I played in a little rock and roll band and uh, uh, we used to do dances at what is, what is, what used to be the women's YWC, the YWCA, mm -hmm. which is the building which still stands on Magnolia and 8th Street. Uh, and they had a little gym, gym there. And we used to have dances on Saturday night and uh, my little band would be playing. And uh, so I did that. I had a brother who played piano on, on ML King in, in a couple of the clubs. So, uh, that was great influences in my life. My high school teacher was a Hampton graduate, Mrs. Simmons. Absolutely. She literally deposited me on the campus of Hampton. Wow. I mean, she put me <laughs> in her 1955 Mercury and group and drove me right to Hampton. Uh, wow. Yeah. So she was, uh, and there were, I mean, there were teachers all over Chattanooga and, uh, you know, the, the thing is important that education was, was more family oriented. It was indeed a community mm -hmm. you, and, and how you one learned uh, about art and about, about everything in life. I mean, I was a boy scout, I was a cub scout. I was also active in the youth NAACP. I, I was really active in an awful lot of things. My first church job was around the corner from where I lived. Mm -hmm. And the church is no longer there, but a church, a new building is at Clegg's Chapel, which is right on uh, uh, East 3rd Street. And um, I was playing Sunday school there from the age eight through high school. Mm -hmm. So that was my first church job. Yeah. 50 cents a Sunday. When you say uh, you played Sunday school, what, what did you do? You just played the piano? Played the piano, yeah, yeah. for the hymns and the singing and, and, and then the singing that was going on in Sunday school. And then after that, which was usually around 9.30 to 10.30, then my father would drive by in the truck, pick me up and take me to the South Side where we attended church regularly and where the family church, church service was going at St. Paul AME, which is uh, right on 25th and William Street, right down the street from all, from, from the Howard School. Mm -hmm. So I, and, and eventually there I became a choir director at 15 years old, I was yeah. choir director of the senior choir yeah. at St. Paul. So I, I've had the church contributed significantly to my, my growing up. That's awesome. And, and you mentioned about the NAACP just now, and I know that you, you know, grew up, grew into adulthood during the civil rights movement. Right? Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit about how arts and culture serve the objectives of the civil rights movement? 
Well, of course, uh, the music of the movement was very, very, very important because it was the spiritual. Uh, you had all the spirituals that were used. Uh, you know, ain't nobody gonna turn me around. Uh, you know, the marching songs. Uh, so that was an important part. And, and also in, in terms of preserving the spiritual, so my commitment was there. Also, every meeting opened with the lift every voice and sing. You know, that was the opening hymn and the closing hymn was We Shall Overcome. Mm -hmm. So that was every meeting, every civil rights meeting everywhere in the country. I mean, it became a, a, a universal thing to sing, lift every voice, and to close with the uh, We Shall Overcome. So um, that part of music was an important part to the civil rights movement. And it still goes on, even with, with not only civil rights, I mean, all, all you can see demonstrations today for anything and they, they will just strike up on a spiritual yeah, you know, yeah. about their rights so that had a great influence uh, the music of this area is there do you think that there are lessons that we can learn in in contemporary movements from the civil rights movements as it relates to the use of art uh, of the songs of culture like that. Well, indeed, we have, and, and we do. You know, we had all those wonderful singers, those blues singers, those rhythm and blues singers who, who were active and participating. And even if we can go all the way back to, uh, uh, wow, uh, the early, and I'm trying to think of the song, it won't come to me now. Um, but a very important song in terms of the civil rights movement and what was happening in the world, even with the blues singer, Lady Holiday, I think mm -hmm. it was, yeah, 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 did one of those songs. And, and, and of course we had uh, Bessie Smith out of Chattanooga singing the blues. We had, uh, and, and, and the impressions all around out of Chattanooga off of Ninth Street, uh, you know. And they were all singing songs that were not only of the black, of the black movement, but also about man's inhumaneness to man. And, and it, it's, it's important that the music continues to be an important part. Even the rap, the hip hop is important in, 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 in the rights movement. So all types of music are being used in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to switch gears a little bit, um, I know that you said you know, the NAACP used the song to open up their meetings, but uh, what was your first introduction to Lift Every Voice and Sing? Elementary school, you know, as in, in, in the 1940s and 50s, in the 40s, you, you would sing uh, My Country Tis of Thee every morning. You had, you, we used to have devotions. You know, so we would open up school with, uh, you would have my country to the bee, you would have prayer, you have pledge to, uh, to the American flag, a pledge to the Christian flag. I mean, you did all of that. And then you would sing, uh, might sing the Star Spangled, the first verse of Star Spangled Banner, and then you would sing, lift every voice and sing. I mean, you do this every morning. So that's how you knew. And you had to learn all three verses. You couldn't just get away with one. <laughs> you, know, you had to learn all three verses of lift every voice and sing but that was my first and even i mean we would sing songs to open up boy scout meeting i mean it was like because all of those activities were so related to the church you know so so that that became a part we would sing it in in, in boy scout meeting our cub scout meeting and then of course with the youth meetings in the evening at the church lift every voice was a song for special occasions but we sang it at most gatherings and not just special occasions but when people got together and 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 we used to have Sunday afternoon programs at churches now. Right. We don't have those anymore like we used to. We, you know, you spend all day Sunday in church. You couldn't even think about going to a movie. You know, not, not on Sunday. Yeah. Well, you, you know, so you grew up singing the song at school. What, what inspired you or why did you decide to do 
your arrangement? Where, where did that come from? Well, let me go back uh, and, and let me remind you. I was part of the 1960 class of Howard School, which was responsible for the sit-ins here in Chattanooga. Uh, you know, I, I, I participated a little bit, and I don't want to romanticize this thing, but my mama told me to bring my butt home. You know, <laughs> right? mm -hmm. so I get off the bus and go through through the 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 store uh, through Cresses, the the downtown mm -hmm. uh, where uh, it was a five and dime store right there at ML King and uh, right there where Miller Plaza, the old Miller Plaza stages, yeah, the store was right in that area, mm -hmm. and I'd go right through the front door and out the back door and go get the bus and get my butt home like my mom told me. So she worked from some very prominent people and it was important to her that I not be involved in that. Oh, she was afraid of you losing her job and doing that. But uh, so, but uh, that's uh, the song, uh, my goodness, uh, became important to me. And also I, I must say, there's another spot I was, involved in, which was not very well known around here, but there was an area up on the side of uh, Mount Eagle called uh, Highlander Folk School. You know about the Highlander. You know Highlander oh, Folk yeah, School? We love Highlander. Okay. I attended Highlander in 1957 okay. with Septima Clark yes. and some of those other people. Yeah. And the guy out of Clinton, Tennessee. Uh, who was the first to the high the school? School, there, yeah, yeah, this school. yeah. He was there that summer, and Eleanor Roosevelt was wow. there that summer. So I was a part of that 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 camp. That summer, I'm fifty seven or fifty eight, somewhere around yeah. there. Before it moved, I think it moved to it's Knox near, County, yeah, it's near Knoxville yeah, now. Yes, yeah, right? yes, <laughs> yes. So you know about yes. that. So I was involved in all of that. So you can see that this this song had great meaning mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. So when I finished, uh, the reason I chose to do this, I was invited back to Chattanooga after I took the job, at, after going to Hampton and becoming choir director at Hampton. And I was invited, my high school teacher, as I say, she deposited me there. But she and uh, another teacher, there was the, they opened the high school, um, Riverside High School opened mm -hmm. about six or seven years after I left Chattanooga in 1960. I think uh, Riverside must have opened around 65 or 66. And one of my, my teachers, so there were two high schools for Blacks before the integration of mm -hmm. uh, the schools. Um, so they invited me back, being a new choir director, college choir director, to direct the two high school choirs together uh, uh, in 1970. Now, I was doing this piece. I was going to write this arrangement for, for those two choirs, but time ran out and I didn't get to finish it during that time. So it was, I didn't finish it till four years later. But uh, it was uh, the important thing here is that we as choir directors or we had programmed, we had learned to open programs with, with certain songs and we would close the pro most choral programs would close with a big rendition of Battle Hymn of the Republic, you know, mm -hmm. the, the choirs were singing glory, glory, hallelujah. And I decided I wanted to end with something else, something more. And the song had much more meaning to me. And of course, this was the time of the Vietnamese War and, mm -hmm. And, and I was very sensitive with my work with NAACP and the civil rights movement that, that this was also uh, about man's inhumaneness to man, not just here in this country, but all over the world. And it was a song, and I thought Lift Every Voice was a song and text that could have meaning for everybody, not just the Black National Anthem. So I wanted everybody to learn and know this song. And eventually, it, it's amazing what started happening. Even all the major congregations, uh, 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 hymnals, uh, major churches and congregations start printing the hymn in, in the book, the United Methodist Church. The Catholic uh, had a Black supplement 
to uh, the hymn called Lead Me, Guide Me. The United Methodists had one called Songs of Zion. And these hymns, people start spreading and using, lift every voice as a hymn. Yeah. And, and not only, and they would sing it, of course they would sing it in February. You know, <laughs> that, 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 that was the only time they would sing it. But that's, uh, but that was an important part of the hymn to me. And that's why I wanted to undertake to do something to make it uh, that choirs all over the country and all over the world could embrace. So mm -hmm. my goal was was met. Right. I, I, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say it quite like that, but after some 45 years, you earned it. <laughs> ah, you're very kind. You're very kind. You're kind. I got. I mean, there are orchestras and choruses all over the world doing doing the arrangement, and uh, actually, it, it, it's. I don't know if people know. Uh, well, many people who who have been in choirs and know the arrangements of battle hymn that we used to sing in choirs. That there's a real relationship of my arrangement of lift every voice and sing to the old arrangements of the battle hymn of the Republic. Okay. Actually, I use those as a model for, yeah. for, for my arrangement. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking about the, um, I guess the impact the song has had, your arrangement of it, right? Um, I know that last year, I feel that the, the NFL decided that they wanted to use it to to open this year of football. And we know all of the problematics with the NFL, right? right. Um, and, I, and, and you know, there's so much of what we see coming out of black people's struggles and, and, and tr tragic things that happen is these s symbolic gestures. How do you feel about um, this song uh, and your arrangement of it in particular being used as a part of this well, let me clear. Okay. Now, my my arrangement necessarily was not the arrangement was. I mean, it was one of the ones that okay. was used. Actually, the big game uh, was it the Super Bowl. Was that, uh, yeah, something I very young. Uh, they yeah. used that. Uh, Clark Atlanta University uh, opened the Super Bowl with with, okay. with my arrangement of it. Okay. But back in October, they were just going to use the song. Okay. So uh, the problem with my arrangement is that it would take six minutes to <laughs> to do the whole thing yeah, so so they weren't going to do that every day <laughs> and they would need a choir that could sing right. i mean really sing <laughs> that could be hard to find <laughs> i mean uh, to get it done but uh no but uh the clark atlanta uh, that was exciting to get them, and and they had to do some cuts mm -hmm. to it, but 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 they were tastefully done, and and and, and those kids looked great. It was a very exciting time. Whereas I, I I I was just excited. I was in tears watching them during the opening of the the Super Bowl, but um, I I I had some issues or concerns. Uh, uh, I don't know how they were going to be sure that people knew words or if they were going to know them. I want to, if they're going to do it, I want to see the words up on the big screen so everybody know what they're singing about. But to do one verse would not dare embrace the nature of what that song is all about. Because, you know, um, Johnson, not only, he didn't really cast aspersions on uh, Americans or, or, or the white Americans, but he made reference to those things that had caused us to want or have the hope that we had mm -hmm. and it wasn't a put down he that he just made the history apparent to everybody you know and therefore I, I i felt comfortable that people of all races could embrace that as part of history and and sing the song so mm -hmm. that's that's where it goes because the first verse is all about dreaming of hope rising sun till victory is won you know then the second verse goes home and tell you about you beating us with them uh, you know with the whips and all of the things in the father's side and all of that but then the third verse is the one where uh dr lowry opened uh 
gave the benedictory prayer at Obama's inauguration, mm -hmm. God of our weary years. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's some of, I, I called that third verse, uh, James Weldon Johnson's uh, eighth trombone. I don't know if you know James Weldon Johnson, he has uh, a, a, a set of poems, God's trombones, uh, ministers of prayers and sermons. And uh, I called this really the eighth trombone, the, eighth, the trombone being the preacher. And, uh, and, and the God of our weary years, God of our silent years. I, 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 I use that as an old deacon praying, you know, it, it, and that verse, he goes through all of this stuff, calling on the Lord and tell him how good he is, where he been and brought us through all of these things. But it gets all the way down to a one line prayer. Mm -hmm. a, he starts out, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who by, hasn't said a word yet, thou who has by thy right. might kept, led us into the light, you know, right. the prayer, right. keep us in the path that we pray. That's the main line of that whole thing. Yeah. And it goes on from there. I'm sorry. No, that's, that's, that's <laughs> excellent. I mean, you know, that, that's a, a, a great breakdown of the, of the verses of the song. And, and we definitely appreciate that. Um, Alana, you want to jump in before I, this one? Sure. Okay. Um, I'd say you mentioned, you know, a little bit about the impact that it's had on people, the song, but did you like when you first arranged this piece, did you think that it would have such a large impact on people? I had no idea. Listen, I was, uh, the real big performance that I remember was in 19... 74 at a national conference of musicians. Actually, the National Association of Negro Musicians allowed me to introduce it then to the conference in San Francisco. And it just went over so big. People embraced it. And, 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 and then I submitted it to a company to be published, you know. But they were interested in it in 1974 or so, but they gave me permission to publish it myself. So I self-published it wow. and started my own publication, it, 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 publishing house in 1978. Uh, it took me four years to get that done. And so happy to say, I must say that now my company, I started for the preservation and publication of music by Black composers yes. and Black traditions is now published by one of the largest, my catalog is now released by one of the largest music publishers in the country. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, so I want to switch gears back again. Um, and you've been back in Chattanooga for, uh, what, 30 years? 30, yeah, actually, yeah, 31. 31 years. 32. So, <laughs> 32, 89, yeah, 32 okay. years, yeah. So mm -hmm. you've seen a lot. You've seen a lot of changes in Chattanooga. I have indeed. I came back at the time of the Renaissance. Okay. That's when we began with the all the things down the, 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 the uh -huh. Discovery Museum and all of that, and, and being on the boards and the, of, of these var various developmental associations. I also served on Tennessee Arts Commission Board, and uh, I had the pleasure of being on Arts Bill, Arts uh, Allied Arts Board. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but 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 feel a very important part of what has gone on and what happened. And I must say also that I had, you know, having grown up in Chattanooga in the 40s and 50s, big segregation, had our black theaters down on ML King, and you know, you knew where you could go uh, or where you weren't supposed to go, you know, but to come back and 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 when I left in 1960 or graduated from high school, I couldn't go to school. I couldn't go to university then Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. I could not. But 30 years later, 29 years later, I could come back as head of the Department of Music at an institution that I couldn't go to. Yeah. So that was that was a thrill. But I'm now that wasn't just an answer in itself now, not by any means. Right. 
uh, because there were still things happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're still and we're still fighting the battle now. Right. I'm I'm not going to make it pretty. Right. You know, it, it still takes a lot to fight the battle, and and I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a new piece of music now, mm -hmm. um, in honor of John Lewis. Okay. And that piece of music says, "Make some noise, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, silence, no more." You still got to speak. Talk about it. I agree, and, and and you know, I think about we are definitely seeing. I think in many parts of our region, this sort of infusion of art and and activism. Right? Can Absolutely. you talk a little bit about what that what that scene is like currently in Chattanooga? What are we seeing here? Well, actually, I'm sort of out of the scene now. I, being the retired person, enjoy. In enjoying being <laughs> retired. Do you hear me? I don't don't do anything. Don't want to do I, anything. Okay. Yeah, you did your part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have no, but I and it, it it's unfortunate that I don't keep up with as much as of what's happening now. But I I I want. I'm happy to see what is happening. That I'm uh, with a number of young people who are getting active in in the arts and with Allied Arts Bill, <laughs> what it's doing now, and and I happen to look up on one of those uh, Thursday night events that they're doing. On, uh, I, I didn't get here. But I'm going to participate in, in those. Uh, and that's really exciting. And to see what happened, I think there was a, a business, even, even with the Hunter Museum, had a group of, of young businessmen getting, uh, getting together and being proactive about. And, and it's not just about, it's not just about demonstrating are doing it's about enlightening and educating people right. of all races right. you know to make people aware of what's going on and 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 helping to teach and educate uh if we just demonstrate if we demonstrate without educating then we're, we're going to be here another 400 years talking about this later mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what we should have done well, you said that you sit on a lot of the boards or you have sat on a lot of the boards. Um, what do you see as some of the challenges that are facing um, Black organizations or minority arts organizations or people, um, cultural workers today from the funding perspective? Well, I don't know. And, and maybe having grown up the way I did and, and, and seeing what I see, much of the cost the we need to educate people about costs in the arts mm -hmm. and for artists you know we used to doing things and getting it free you know uh, and 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 much of that has to come through the culture that, that there's been a cultural thing that it's been that has influenced us and and much of that and and much of that is the church it's free. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You understand? But and and much of it is to get people to understand that they can too. We just don't want people to give to us. But blacks are capable, and are, many of them have the wherewithal to contribute too. And we need to expand the base of giving in our community. Uh, we can't just not just keep asking to get it, but we need we need to contribute and we need to educate people to make contributions to the arts. And so I'm thinking, you know, um, what are what do you think that emerging artists need but aren't getting to cultivate their inspiration and be successful and to contribute? Oh, there's some great things happening. I'm I'm not sure. Um, Emerging artists are, 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 have many, many opportunities, but what happens is that they don't always get the opportunity. They don't take advantage of the opportunities to do that. Well, the educational opportunities, and, and by that, I mean the lessons that they need. They can do things naturally, mm -hmm. but they won't refine them. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I, I, I've offered lessons to people who play for churches, uh, gospel music and free, and tell them, I'll teach you free, you know, so you can learn to read and improve what you do. No, but they're too content with what they're able, because people will build them up and tell them, oh, you're good, and you got, and they go without getting a deep, education and training in India. So it's not, it, we have to impress upon young people the importance of study. Mm. That's, that's so crucial. And, and whether you want to be jazz, rhythm and blues or whatever, it, it's not, studying doesn't say you, you, you're being classic, you know, <laughs> in, in, in that way, or that it has to be the classical arts, but it, it embraces all arts. I mean, I, I see the wonderful things that happen. I drive down 11th Street or 10th Street over here and you see the mirage. I remember when Howard School put the mirage out there, River, River, uh, what? River Road right, right across the street from uh, the emissions thing, their whole thing of high school students. I was part of Allied Arts when they were doing that. But that's art all over here. Right. And we got to get some of these kids out of these communities. There's still kids who have not, not been downtown Chattanooga who live around here. Right. Now, do you think that it's a it's a it's a kind of understanding of art as one thing, right? Like, um, like you you mentioned the classics, right? So that it's only when it's produced this way that it is art. And so people sort of separate themselves from that. They don't feel like they fit into that box. Well, it's a separation of, of, of the fact that the folk traditions are, are not always embraced or are, are given the name of art, uh, right. you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, we may use the process, we may use painting, uh, drawing, but we don't Mm -hmm. classic into the, or playing an instrument, but we don't always refer to it as an art. Mm -hmm. And so we need to educate, again, people. It's, it, it, it's, it's a big process. Uh, I'm not sure I have the solutions or the answers to any of this. I'm old fashioned. I'm <laughs> well, is there, I know this has been great. Is there, is there anything that we didn't ask that you want to share? about any of the above, any of the things that we talked about? I can't think of, you've been fairly thorough <laughs> with me, uh, catching me off guard here, <laughs> making me think deeply. Uh, no, thank you for the opportunity of being here. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Thank I you. should have had the list of questions before. Oh, you. Okay. <laughs> Next time I will be sure to, to send them off. But we are we are so grateful for you for uh, sharing your time with us and, and coming in to do this in person with us we really appreciate it is it over already uh, we, we i was worried talk. about being able to talk for 40 minutes okay thank you very much <laughs> yes thank you thank you this has been such a wonderful and informative conversation i hope that everyone's spirit has really been fed in the way that mine has for sure least. um dr carter thank you so much for being here with us today we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to speak with us and our thank virtual you. audience thank you for sure we would definitely like to engage the audience if there's time for that um but we, before we do we do have to before we get to something like that if there's time we do have to make a shameless plug for our work um, if you like what you've heard today and want to hear more um, similar stories other stories from the region um, please be sure to download the black and appalachia podcast wherever you get podcasts we are on all of the platforms also follow us on the socials we are black and appalachia on facebook and instagram and twitter and uh, tiktok now a little bit of TikTok. <laughs> and all the other places um, uh, you can also send us an email for more information um, about our podcast, the podcast at blackandappalachia.org. And we also have a website, uh, blackandappalachia.org. We try to keep it simple and easy for everybody to remember. <laughs> for sure. Make sure you subscribe and follow. Also, leave us reviews and share the podcast with somebody else. Again, I'm Nkeshi Yelamine, and you can follow me on Sewing Sociologist on Instagram. I'm Alana Norwood, and you can find my work on the Black and Appalachia website. Uh, we want to definitely shout out the Arts Build crew. Shout out to James. Uh, shout out to Monica and Stratton. He's been great. And 
and Ben. Yeah, and Ben, <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for helping us uh, facilitate this conference and being a part of it. Again, we want to shout out uh, Chef Kenyatta for the amazing dinner that we had last night. Um, and if and if we missed anyone, thank you all for making this all happen. It was a pleasure being here. All right. Thank you. I do think we we have a little bit of time for questions if, if people wanted to ask a couple before we close out. You could just unmute yourself or put it in the chat. If no one's going to speak up, this is Monica. I'm just going to say there is a ton of praise for you, Dr. Carter, in this chat. Uh, lots of folks who've known you and are very grateful for all of the work you have done, um, and, you know, and the history that you have shared, but also you have created and made. Um, there is a thank you. Let's see here. One says, Dr. Carter, you can truly say, let the work that I have done speak for me. Thank you for your plethora of contributions to the Chattanooga and the world. Um, let's see here. Uh, they loved, they loved, Vanessa Jackson loved Mrs. Stovall too. It was her mama's piano teacher. So you, you really are bringing back a lot of memories for a lot of folks and it means the world. So thank you. Well, if we don't have any uh, further questions, um, I was just going to say, uh, you know, as I listened to uh, Dr. Carter and um, Dr. Elamin and Ivana, it just reminded me of the importance of having relationships and listening and learning from, from wise elders in our community. And, um, you know, it's, it's incredible that in his life, you can see the impact of a lifetime spent in the arts and early influences uh, on the arts in his life as a young person. Um, the importance of strong institutions in our communities, you know, and the, just the, the value of preserving and passing on our culture from generation to generation. And um, also I, I'm gonna thank this weekend a lot about what he said about education and um, educating people about the costs of the arts, um, because I think that is something that's so important. And I think that the pandemic has kind of shown us even more so that we have to come up with ways to really help people understand the arts contribute, but the arts cost too. Um, we can't give away everything for free. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated today, uh, to every presenter, every person who came together and made this possible. Um, I wanna thank all of our speakers and of course, thank our funders one more time, the Unum Social Justice Fund, Lindhurst, Penwood and Footprint Foundations, and all of the individual donors to Arts Build who make things like this possible. I encourage you to follow us on social media and to sign up for our newsletter where we will share information about all of our grants and programs. Um, we have written a lot of grants to the NEA this year. So um, follow us because if we get awarded some of those, it's gonna be a lot of money coming to the arts and culture institutions in Chattanooga. And we're excited uh, to be able to just, you know, play that role and continue to pursue as much funding for people as possible. Um, so I encourage you to have a great weekend. Thank you for being part of our first um, Equity in the Arts Conference. And if we can raise money again for it next year, <laughs> we'll have it. We'll have our second Equity in the Arts Conference. Um, but we appreciate you all and um, thank you for all of the work that you do to make Chattanooga a great place to live, work, and play. And you all have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, y'all.